So good morning, everyone. Uh, good morning to our participants, to the organizers of this uh, webinar event for today. Uh, good morning po dun sa mga uh, UPLB staff and constituents po. And of course, the UPLB alumni uh, from the Philippines and, and, and to various parts of the world. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening po. So welcome to the UPLB Alumni Industry uh, Summit webinar series. And just to give a brief background of today's, uh, in today's event, so the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, through the Office of Alumni uh, Relations, organize this webinar series. So for this series, six webinars designed to strengthen the UPLB alumni industry linkage shall be held in the preparation of the UPLB Alumni Summit on November 6, 2021. Each week, a panel of presenters shall provide insights circling on what the university needs and what it can offer, what the alumni industry can offer, and to come up with industries or rather with strategies on how the intrinsic partnership between UPLB and the alumni industry can be boosted to future-proof UPLB and sustain its role as National Center of Excellence. So last week's uh, webinar uh, kick-started the webinar series where the topic on the university perspective was articulated, what UPLB needs and what it can offer. Today's program is entitled UPLB Alumni Industry Linkages and Operational Perspective. I am Mike Laurio and I will be the moderator in today's webinar. And leading us today in the discussions are four panel presenters and discussants who will showcase industries, best practices in capacity building that later on the UPLB may emulate in driving its machinery. So without further ado, to give the, us uh, the opening remarks, let us all welcome Captain Mauro V. Baradas, the president of the UPLB Alumni Association. Okay, magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Welcome to our UPLB Alumni Industry Summit webinar uh, series of 2021. So nakakagalak po na tayo ay muli nagkasama-sama uh, sa pamagitan po ng ating webinar. Uh, ito po ating programa ito ay naumpisaan dahil ang ating uh, uh, layunin ay mailapit natin ang ating mga successful uh, alumni dito sa ating university. So ito po ay napag-usapan namin ni Dr. Resti Culiado na magkaroon ng isang industry summit at uh, maybe uh, by the end of this year or early uh, uh, next year ay pagkakaroon tayo ng magandang pagsasama-sama. So ako po ay natutuwa at maraming uh, nag-participate uh, last week. Uh, I've heard more than 300 at uh, uh, I presume na ngayon ay mas dumadami pa. So nakakatuwa na tayong lahat ay muli nagkasama-sama. Kung kailan tayo naging successful ay saka tayo babalik sa universidad. So binabati ko po ang lahat ng mga uh, gumawa nito dito sa ating uh, war room, sa ating uh, base, at uh, sa ating mga participant ngayon sa pagitan ni Mr. Paus Villegas, our lead uh, panelist, Mr. Billy Boy Gualberto, uh, Dr. Gas Molina, Mr. Michael Cart uh, Rakuber. So mga kasama, welcome. Magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Thank you very much, uh, Captain Baradas. So now to give us the welcome remarks, may I call on from the College of Engineering and Agro-Industrial Technology and the head of today's webinar event, Dr. Myra G. Borinas. Good, um, magandang umaga po sa ating lahat. Um, I would like to welcome you all to the second leg of the webinar series uh, entitled um, Academ uh, Alumni Industry Linkages and Operational Perspective perspective. So this webinar series, as mentioned by Sir Mike, is a prelude for the UPLB Alumni Industry Summit, which will be held on November 6. So we are very fortunate that uh, we have with us prominent uh, speakers from the industry uh, who will share with us their valuable experience. And I think all of them are um, our own alumni. So I hope that, this, that through this webinar, we will be able to know how UPLB can strengthen its partnership with the alumni and industry and uh, define strategies to future-proof uh, UPLB. 
I hope for your active participation in this webinar through the open uh, forum. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, again, good morning to, to all of you. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Captain Baradas and Dr. Barinas, for the very warm welcome and the insightful challenges for today's program. Uh, we hope that uh, what uh, anything that would transpire for this event shall be uh, weaved into the objective of the alumni in UPLB Alumni Industry Summit by November 6, uh, 2021. Now, uh, before we proceed with our panel discussions, a couple of reminders for the participants of today's webinar on our Zoom etiquette. So please keep your comments respectful and constructive to the webinar speakers and organize. For questions um, to the panel members, kindly type in your questions in the in the uh, Q&A box found, at, uh, found below, okay? found at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and not in the chat box. Okay? Um, then for those, for the participants, kindly answer the evaluation form. The link will be sent later after the event uh, to secure your e-certificate of attendance. So, Ready na ba? Ready na ba ang ating mga participants for today's uh, series or rather for today's uh, series of talks? Okay, so for today, we will be led, our panel members shall be led uh, by Dr. or rather by Mr. Pablito M. Villegas and he'll be the, uh, today's lead panelist, also known as Pabs. Graduated in 1969 under the BS in Agricultural Program of the College of Agriculture of the University of the Philippines. He earned his Master of Science in Agricultural Economics and Agribusiness in 1974 at the University of Georgia in USA. Currently, Mr. Villegas is a practicing agroecological organic agriculturist and integrated coconut base and agroforestry farmer in the province of Batangas, Philippines. Our lead panelist has held key positions in 20 countries globally, including those in the ASEAN region, Asia Pacific region, and even in the Southern, Central, and Western Africa region. Mr. Villegas is now a practicing owner, social entrepreneur of the Villegas Organic and Hobby Ecotourism Farms, the Boho Ecotourism Corporation, and the Sustainable Agriculture and Entrepreneurship or SAGE Learning Center in Malvar, Batangas, Philippines. He's also the chairperson of the Malvar Organic Farmers Agriculture Cooperative. As board member and vice president of Moringaling Philippines Foundation Incorporated, Mr. Villegas is passionate in promoting Malungay or Moringa as a total health food and social enterprise. He serves as the director and treasurer of the Philippine Chamber of Agriculture and Food Incorporated, immediate past president and director of the Confederation of Filipino Consulting Organizations Incorporated, founding member of the Intercontinental Network of Organic Farmers Organization, co-convenor of one Organic Movement Philippines and member of the International Federation of Organic Agriculture Movements and the Coalition on Agriculture Modernization and the Philippines. Our lead panelist is a multi-awarded professional and has been accredited by the Philippine Center of, uh, on Entrepreneurship as an agriculture mentor under the Go Negocio Kapatid Mentor Me program in collaboration with the Department of Agriculture and its Agricultural Training Institute, Department of Trade and Industry, and Department of Agrarian Reform. Among his local and international distinctions, to name a few, include the Paida Gawi Award in 1978, Isaiah Recognition Award 1990, UPLB Distinguished Alumnus Award 1984, University of the Philippines Alumni Association Incorporated Outstanding Professional Award in Agriculture, Land Bank Achievement Award in 1990, Most Outstanding Professional Award of Malvar Batangas, and 2017 Leadership and Excellence Award on Agricultural Policy and Governance of the Association on Agriculture Technology of South 
East Asia based in Bangkok, Thailand. To cap his golden years of leadership, techno-managerial, professional, and entrepreneurial business management services, Mr. Villegas is among the top 100 recipients of the Centennial Outstanding Alumnus of the UPLB College of Economics and Management and of the Department of Agricultural Economics in 2019. Most importantly, he was recognized with the 2019 Golden Jubilarian Award of the UPLB Alumni Association for his exceptional achievements and outstanding contributions to national and international agricultural and rural development. He is a semi-retired freelance international consultant on agricultural economics, supply and value added chain, and enterprise development and agro-industrial business management. Central to this works, tackles food and nutrition security, inclusive growth and poverty reduction, agro-industrial development, inclusive agribusiness management, and micro-farming and ecotourism enterprise system. Here with us today to expound on manufacturing-based agro-industrialization through the supply and value added chain and agro-processing clusters framework and business models, may we now call on Mr. Pablito M. Villegas. Good morning, good morning. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Laurio, for that very <laughs> extensive. I, I only put a small paragraph uh, to the to the organizers, but I am really uh, thankful to you, but uh, that's too long. <laughs> so uh, good morning to all, especially to UPLB Chancellor uh, Don Camacho, to President uh, Manny Brothers, uh, and the UPA, LBAA, uh, also to Resti Culiado, to the webinar se seminar organizing committee, Rex Navarro, Ciel Habito, and of course, the chair of our session, uh, Dr. Mayra Burines, no? My co-panelists, I will not uh, mention you anymore because you will be lengthily introduced also. So today I would like to bring you a, a different perspective uh, as you know, a strategy for future proofing of the university or the academy in linkage with our alumni and more importantly, with the industry and the private sector. And, you know, this is the product of my work, uh, one, one uh, year work, on, not only in Indonesia, but globally, where I have been uh, exposing the, the concept or the, the, the approach to agricultural modernization. This is the manufacturing base, agro-industrialization, the supply and value added chain, and agro-processing cluster framework and business model. So I will discuss more the theoretical framework because my co-panelists will discuss how these are being integrated in their, in their work and how they are, you know, earning millions as well as employing, employing people and reaching out to the smallholders in the respective areas of operation. So that's the operational perspective. And hopefully I will be, we will be able to contribute to the future proofing of, uh, of strategies of the UPLB. So let my, my, work, my presentation will, will focus on where are we now? Where do we want to go? And finally, how do we go there? So, well, uh, let me start with a sorry note, uh, according to Dr. Walden Bellio, the Philippine agriculture is dying. What will it take to save it? So this is a speech he delivered in the Development Bank of the Philippines. So agriculture has transformed or uh, we say retrograde, retrograded from a self-sufficient and self-reliant agricultural economy to a highly import dependent one. So, so where imports overwhelms our domestic production at the ratio of two to one. Uh, this involves around uh, uh, 23 billion dollars where our domestic production is only about 6.2 with uh, more than uh, 16 billion dollars being imported. Next. So, well, so we also have suffering now from a dysfunctional import dependent and food 
agriculture system. So this functionality is the key word that we have described, no? Because this really is a problem of uh, that uh, of our low total uh, low factor productivity in terms of labor, la land, capital, and management, leading to low income, the cycle of poverty, food insecurity, and then poor health, physical and cognitive death, uh, and climate change problems in our country today. Next, please. So, so you see the prevalence of malnutrition, undernutrition, micronutrient not, not deficiency, overnutrition, stunting, obesity, and wasting. So you can see that in the picture. So the future of our children is, you know, at, at, whole, at whole year, she meaning uh, at least year. Go ahead, next please, yeah. So, associated from policies, okay, let me summarize, just give you high incidence of rural poverty, more than 30%, high food import dependency, food nutrition and health insecurity and dysfunctional agriculture system, severe disconnect between academe, the FUP, and of course the SUCs, and the agro-based industries, the farmers, and the fisher folks, and our failure to integrate smallholders with agro-based industries, the weak research for development and extension linkages of agri-agro sector within the supply and value added chain, and the acute, acute disconnect between agriculture and industry sectors, as well as services sectors that should be brought together in order to have a modernized agriculture going. And more seriously, the exploitative market power of traders, money lenders, and middlemen, as shown in my chart here, where everybody passes through a lot of multi-chain exploiters, you know, that, that before it reaches the product of the farmers, reaches the final consumer. Next, please. But we have also an enabling environment. We have also an enabling environment. We are, we are a country where we are very good in planning the Agri-Agra Act of 97, Micro small enterprise law, barangay and micro business uh, enterprise law, agri agra law, the ease of doing business law, Balik Provincia, ba BSP policy inclusive finance and value chain financing policies, WTO safeguard safeguards act and sanitary and phytosanitary legislation. But the question is, we have enabling uh, laws, but we are short in governance and much more short in execution. Uh, and also the underfunding of the agriculture sector remain a big challenge. So what are these major challenges now? To the UPLB, alumni industry linkages. How do we proceed given the policy and strategic issues amidst an enabling environment? So first and foremost, the modernization, the modernization of Philippine agriculture uh, must be focused on liberating small farmers and fisher folks from poverty and dysfunctional food system as well as food import dependency this is our you know our uh, advocacy within the camp headed by Amy Rabier, of course and don rasco and also in the pkp headed by good friend uh, uh, you know uh, our, our good, uh, good friend from uh, from from pkp danny uh, danny Pausto. The need to go beyond integrated technological solution. This is where university excels, but we must integrate pre-production with the production, post-harvest, processing technologies. I think there is a big disconnect there. We need to connect them together so that the, the value chain can work in favor of the farmers. Let us look at this, the, the supply and value added chain approach, the CPM, how do we integrate credit with production technology and marketing, the ABIC business model, agri-based agri agri industrial clustering business model, and the role. This is again a very important part that we have missed in the, in, uh, that we must be able to, to address in the future proofing of our university uh, operations. The, uh, the role of related suppliers, supporting and allied industries that are key to the modernization of Philippine agriculture and the need to treat agriculture as a agribusiness enterprise not you know a, a poor enter or not a you know uh, they say it uh, business as usual or uh, this is just a an, an ordinary survival agriculture uh, operation and more importantly 
income and poverty reduction approach to smallholder agriculture. Family farm income must be higher than UN poverty rate of $2 per day for a family of five. That's 15,000 per month. How can we make farmers earn 15,000 a month? Or that is basically uh, 180,000 uh, pesos per year for a family of five. So next, please. Okay. I would like to propose here three prong strategies that for the restructuring of the dysfunctional and import dependent food and agriculture system. And where UPLB, alumni, industry, and private sector linkages will make a big, big difference. True? Number one, simplified and shortened value chain through the CPM integration or creative production marketing integration and the producers cooperative linkage with user skin. So how do we bring the farmers directly with the consumers or end users? Number two, because we have already transformed from agrarian reform having about three to five hectares of land over a period of six generations, they have now been transformed not only anymore into a smallholder, but micro level smallholder that needs management of the supply and value added chain for increasing productivity and income and micro residential farming from farm tourism enterprise system. Again, that is a tall order that will be needed in the in the proof, uh, you know, future proofing of our system. And uh, finally, the, the, the method to macro level agro based industrial clustering schemes, corporate, cooperative, corporative, cluster agriculture. Uh, this was uh, more or less the product of my uh, more than one year work, uh, not only in Indonesia, but globally. Uh, towards this, next please. So let me show you clearly how the, uh, the, the producer and end user linkage will operate. So you have uh, inclusive finance, technology-based, uh, pre-production, production, process up to processing. Then you show here that, that the, it is leading directly to the processors because there will be logistic handling and storage that will be discussed also here. But more importantly, the end users, the processors, institutional markets, the supermarkets, exporters, the consumers, homeowners association must be able to provide purchase orders, purchase orders for the farmers to respond. So that they call it, the farmers will respond to appropriate and responsive or, or uh, remunerative price signals. So this will mean the shifting of market powers from traders, important money lenders to, uh, to the food producers themselves and their cooperative. This will mean decentralized rural financing working under production uh, credit, production technology, market linkages. And more importantly, the purchase orders issued by the end users must be enforceable. This will transcend the normal market matching, which has no enforcement power. So the, the key here is the enforcement of the purchase order principle, the purchase order operationalization in terms of product quantity product quality in terms of time and in terms of prices that must be responsive enough so that farmers will respond more positively to the to the system well let let me correlate this with the 1da reform agenda consolidation modernization industrialization professionalization okay the key here is da must focus on plant 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 program his main function is to provide food for, for, for food security for nutrition security and for health security of our people. That is the DA's function. And give the trade, trade, trade programs and functions to the DA, DTI. The, the Department of Agriculture has no business meddling on trade, trade, trade policy that is pro consumer. They must focus on plant, plant, plant uh, programs that will focus on productivity, on income, and on linking farmers directly with the market in collaboration with DTI but DTI handles imports and other concern that is not really directly a, a, a department of agriculture function. In pre-industries, build, 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 to build infrastructure for the agriculture sector, market infrastructures, post-harvest facilities, uh, logistics, and, and of course now, the academy, the OST, CHED, SUCs, to focus on research for development extension so that we will be able to 
effectively link the academy with what the industry needs and what you know the farmers and uh, and our fisher folks need in the process of in their plight for uh, li being liberalized from poverty and food insecurity. Next, please. Yeah. Okay. Let me tackle briefly these three uh, functions that I'm saying. So, restructuring with small holder, I call it micro level and meso to the community level cooperatives. So, true value chain business model. So, the first one is micro residential farming and farm to urban agri tourism enterprise system. So, this must be organized in terms of operational clusters, consolidation of services in the countryside where smallholders predominate. The, we are encouraged here by the by the by the but book I was I think I was still in university is small is beautiful mindset that was showmaker where socialized a residential micro farming and farm tourism enterprise system can operate and we did not go anywhere uh, uh, you know we just have to learn a lot from from countries like Japan Korea Taiwan Indonesia Thailand and, and even now uh, you know Vietnam to that have that are now more on not only on food security but on export oriented agriculture so we will we only need to adapt with adaptation the high productivity you know in terms of total factor and income approach of these neighboring countries we need not we, we just have to follow it is really amazing when i went to thailand they learned about say cooperatives there when i went to, to korea they said they learn you know agriculture including thai, the thais the indonesians and and yet we are lagging behind them in terms of you know productivity and income for our farmers okay the number two is adapt the cpm linkage Ray, you know in the when i was in the land bank this is my instrument because to me lending money is one thing but collecting it is another thing but if i will not be able to link up my credit operation with production technology and market i will be a gunner because i will be part from so it is my responsibility then to ensure that farmers will have access to production technology and will have access to market so that I can collect the money that we're investing in small farmers. So this is the essence of that. So now we are in go-negotio, decentralized lending by land bank, is DBP uh, and the banking system is a must and that must be done to the fullest, particularly in this coming uh, administration that will be the product of our next election. Okay. The formal integration of agripreneurs and farmers in the micro, small, uh, medium enterprise and labor se sector. That problem, my problem, a serious problem now is the social inclusion and protection of our farmers. You know, they, they, they need to be given SSS, access to SSS, field health and EB funds so that they can provide decent housing they can have access to health facilities and more importantly farmers also deserve to have a retirement fund after you know it's a retirement age of about 65 to 70 years old and finally the integration of eco farm tourism in the micro farming with decent residential housing for farmers and fisher folks next please yeah so you see in that, in that one how the abuse farmer in uh, my column the abuse farmer uh, uh, you see in my uh, previous one uh, how they, they call it, the department Ed has issued this thing. How they, they presented the farmer in a very sorry state. So I, I call it now the abuse and exploited farm family. Now we would like to transform a secretary that dream may come true, maybe not now, but for us in the immediate future, a happy farm family together with our partners now that we are talking with in this, pro, in this uh, webinar. Thank you, please. next please. Okay. Let me go now to the, to the third aspect. To the third aspect, this is now the crux of the whole thing because this will now involve the industry in, in its bigger sense. I call this manufacturing based agro industrialization. This may involve corporate farming, cooperative farming, or cooperative, cooperative, corporate, cooperative, or corporative farming, consolidation and clustering of farms and services, and the development of agro-processing investments as social enterprise mobilizers. So in here, I will now see now, I will now be, uh, show you that, that this connect will have now to be connected. We'll have now to be in sync with one another. The agriculture component on your left side, 
the farm inputs and the technology and the raw material that they produce with the primary, with the industry sector, which is concerned with primary processing to secondary tertiary processing, which will now be the core industry system where we have to operate. I think Billy will focus on that. My, uh, even uh, even uh, uh, Mike on the on agri logistics will 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 showcase this. So they, this will be the focal point. So agriculture to become a major growth driver must be restructured now and immediately redirected towards value-added processing and manufacturing base, agro-industrialization, which is one of the pillars of the programs of Secretary Dar, of Nomad, although it's a little late, but we can continue this with the next administration. So the process of connecting agriculture with the industry and services sector. So we now, I will now describe you the simple process. Go ahead, uh, next please. Okay. So when you have that, your core industry now, which is a combination of, you know, the, 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 the DA uh, and DTA partnership in terms of comparative advantages, location, uh, key production areas uh, under the APMA, you, uh, the, the agriculture and fishery development zones definition, the factor endowments, our good soil, water, uh, endowments, the farm clusters and consolidation, will now have to be linked effectively with market, domestic or export trade, where there is competitive, there are competitive advantages in terms of market access, in terms of competition, and in terms of right pricing, so that, and the right quantity and the right quality kind of thing. Go ahead, please, next please. Next one is, but let me show you that there is a, an important uh, factor that must go with that thing. And I call this strong economic foundations or factor conditions, the policy environment, the technology and research and development continuum capability, which is sorely lacking because our investment in research development is so minuscule and the government is so extremely in supporting the RD sector, which is led now by the University of the Philippines, being the premier, the national and the university that must produce the best technology for our farmers, for our agro-based industries. And of course, we need to contend with it to relate more effectively with the supplier industries, the supplier of inputs, technology, machinery, and the core, the, to, to, to the core industry system. And then the role of related, allied and supporting industries, finance and banking, transportation, marketing, machinery repair, capacity training, other, Critical development, like accounting, consulting, auditing, and many more. Next, please. Yeah. So, well, with my work in Indonesia, with the World Bank, on the restructuring of agro-based industries, where I focus, we focus. Okay, I, in here I was with uh, with uh, uh, Rio and also with uh, my, my friend, no. Uh, in in UPLB. So. You will see here that the, even the, the need for clustering, the machinery equipment cluster, the chemical cluster, the agro R&D biotechnology, molecular biology, and the digital technology system, the packaging cluster, transportation and communication partner, all of which will be supporting agriculture inputs related and services sector, research for development of uh, making use that the academic industry are linked together effectively in producing the right agricultural tools, equipment, and machineries for our people, fertilizer, uh, bio pesticides, uh, bio insecticides, herbicides, and most importantly, in UP now, I salute their fermentation technology is one of the best. They have best uh, scientists working on there, uh, led by uh, Rex de Mapiles. And of course, the plant animal breeding, seed plant nutrients, and the bio inoculants, the GMO technology, where <laughs> that's another story. I, 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 I am uh, neutral there initially, okay? And so you will, you will see here that, that the whole system now must support agricultural cropping, forestry-based production, production, animal husbandry, fisheries, where packaging, where, uh, you know, cold storage, bulk handling, you know, processing equipment and machineries, transport, repair, roads, communication, containers will have, and uh, of course, the, the, the infrastructure for export marketing, export trade, 
will have to be put together. And this is now, must now be the focus of the future proofing of the entire agro-industrial modernization system. So, I give you the base model, because this will apply for any commodity, but the base model here you will see is anchored on economic foundation, factor condition, but technology R&D capability, whether they are indigenous, whether they are homegrown, whether globally sourced, or whether they are product of joint venture, will have to be present in order to support our agro-based industries. So you, you have here, I divided it into raw material production, the primary processing, secondary and tertiary processing, link up with market. So under, you have now the supporting industries, production, R&D, the, the, the value chain. So you'll see the, the movement, the value chain must move in terms of value added, in terms of employee, instead of productivity per unit of plant, then you have to move up the, 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 the chain so that we can have efficiency and we can have competitiveness and we can we can fight uh, uh, lower the cost of uh, doing business also lower the cost per unit of products that will be trading not only domestically but also internationally so the supporting upstream industries the focal industries and the down and the supporting downstream so supporting upstream is your agriculture side the raw material and the supporting downstream is your market side and the focal industries will remain as a joint, a, a joint responsibility of agriculture, DTI and DTI, so that we will be able to produce the raw material needed for agro-processing because that is the key. Adequacy of the right quality at the right time of raw materials that we need so that an, a manufacturing industry can flourish. We can have, so we have to consolidate, we have to cluster, we have to ensure that the entire requirement of an agro-based industrial or manufacturing system can be had. And so you see here the role of related and allied industries, I have discussed it. And of course, on the top, the supplier industries, the supplier industries to the agriculture system, agriculture side, or to the supply, supporting upstream, supplier industries to the focal industry, and the, and the support industries, machinery, equipment, inputs, and services system to support downstream up to the time that they will have also, you know, the, the needed infrastructure for market you know uh in terms of export and domestic market next please i will just give you now i did in indonesia <clears throat> i can i have done some my short analysis simply through color coding of course presenting it what are the strengths what are the weakness uh, of the cluster so that we can address now specific problems within areas so that when we do uh, it is just a, a jigsaw puzzle we need to understand where are the weaknesses are and make improvements on it, and where are the, the strengths, so that make further improvements on that, as also the threats, as well as the opportunities. So when we are able to do it in this framework, then we will be addressing the whole thing in terms of a systems approach to agro-industrial modernization. Next, please. So this is, for example, I will just go through. Uh, this is an example of uh, my agro-processing uh, and agricultural equipment and machinery model that I did in Bandung, Indonesia. So yeah, nariyan yan, uh, design, uh, uh, import, local, or fabrication, assembly, repair, okay. I will just give it to you for purposes, just to give you example. This is the one on produce cluster we can do. So we can have a specific commodity-based cluster based on the, the base model that I have presented. If only our academy can put that together, you know, these things, and they will be able to put them in a synchronized, in a coordinated, then we will have a, 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 an orchestrated or a synchronized a system, coordinated system, na, na hindi sabog para tayo ay magkaroon ng effective, uh, say, fruit in, uh, induced cluster next, or, or a cocoa cluster model, or, and, uh, so, so that's it. I have coconut, I have, uh, I have plenty here, I have designed, we have designed, even for tilapia, we have designed that and we can we can help i can help the university uh, do this in, in collaboration with the with your professor with your scientists i can help you put up the the, the the business model for specific commodity that we will be tackling so let me now proceed with the recommendations with you will be alumni so through the pre okay first is the policy reform removal of dysfunctionality and import dependency and coordinated execution effort towards agriculture modernization 
Uh, ito yung ginagawa namin sa CAMP, ginagawa namin sa PKP, ginagawa namin sa, sa other advocacies, that we, Moringali Foundation. Okay. Number two is very important. This is where you can make a difference. Agriculture or agro-based research and development linkages between academia and industry must focus on agro-based industrial consolidation and clustering development that I presented as major growth drivers. So this must be included in your in your academic agenda of UPLB and SUCs in tandem with the the introduction like DTA, DTI, DA, DOST, DNR, DAR, DOT, etc. And more importantly, with the industry players, the private sector under private public sector partnership, PPP, must be another business model that will support the integration of these important ingredients for agro-based manufacturing and industrialization. So DTI and DA must, lead, must work in tandem. Operationalizing the, the APIC as well as the SMAC business model. The Banco Central must provide the, the funds along with inclusive and value chain financing policies. Funding window year, you know there is an idle, idle money, 1.5 trillion from the agri agra fund, 1.5 trillion pesos will be more than enough to modernize Philippine agriculture. And this is only on an annual basis because this is the 25% the, the of the agri agra fund or the total lending portfolio of banks. So that now it's about 1.5 trillion that is lying out there. The banks would rather pay for you know penalties rather than investing this to agro-based industries, to agricultural production and to export manufacturing, uh, export trade, export tax, please. Okay. The inclusion of digital and information technology, yeah, this is again important uh, in, the, in value chain optimization and agro-industrialization. But my friends, this is my appeal. Let us adapt the family farm income approach that must transcend UN poverty threshold of $2 or 500 pesos per day per person, per, per person. A per family, so that of at least five to six persons. So at least we must be able to package a, an income approach that farmers will earn from 15,000 to 30,000 or higher per month per family. Or per this is the key. This is the liberation from poverty. This is their, their, uh, the, this will make them affordable to own a house, a decent house, so that the, to, to send their children to school, to have uh, some funds for medical. Uh, expenses and of course to ensure that there is food nutrition and health security in the home and finally my friends the adoption of internship and apprenticeship training of undergraduate and graduate students as well as faculty members and university researchers in various agro-based industries in sync or in, 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 in relation with supplier industries Supporting industries, related and allied industries and services, now that your UPLB has transformed into a big, huge university system, then I think this can be done and must be done by my, by my most you know, beloved alma mater, the University of the Philippines in Los Baños. And finally, my friend, finally, my friends, let me end by paraphrasing. Senator late Robert Kennedy, also is being used by Emira Beer. Some people saw things as they were and wonder why we see things that never were and ask, why not? Why not? We can do it together. Thank you. Thank you. And good day. Salamat po ng marami sa inyong lahat. Thank you, Paul, for the challenge for UPLB, uh, especially in boosting the UPLB academy and industry uh, linkage. So, yeah, I agree that uh, with the with with the country uh, leading in agricultural production, UPLB can be one of the drivers uh, of modernization in the agricultural industry. So we could integrate uh, into the supply and value added chain concept and also the uh, frameworks model that you have presented in, the, in today's uh, presentation. Okay, so for our participants, to those who have questions, clarifications, or inputs, some ideas 
uh, that they could share uh, for today's uh, webinar, kindly type it in the Q&A. So we have already uh, some of the participants uh, typing in questions. Okay, so later on, sasagutin po natin yan at bibigyan klaro sa ating open forum. Now, earlier uh, at the start of our um, event or program, uh, we have asked a poll question regarding the, uh, if you have participated on any activities related to alumni industry academic uh, industry academic programs. And the answer, okay, or the result of the poll was about 58% answered yes, they have uh, related uh, alumni industry academic program activities, okay, personal experiences. Whereas about 42% answered no. So we could uh, use, para dun sa mga nagsabi ng yes, uh, we could uh, really appreciate uh, if you share your insights regarding your experience to these types of programs so that we could uh, improve yung ating um, initiatives for UPLB alumni industry uh, linkage efforts. For those who have uh, no uh, or are yet to experience, Okay, so we can learn from today's uh, webinar. And for the, of course, for the other webinars that is to come uh, until November 6, uh, 2021. All right, so interesting talk. Um, now, uh, to welcome their rich experiences and ex expertise to support the propositions made by our lead panelists on the supply value added chain, each of our panel discussions shall also present their experiences and their respective fields, as well as their perspectives on how we can mold UPLB into these models through the UPLB alumni industry linkage. So for our next uh, panelist, um, he is also known by his nickname, Billy. He is a scion of the prominent family, political family of Batangas with a BS agriculture degree from UPLB. He started his career in farming by working in the remote barangays of Pampanga as an agricultural extension worker. Later, he was chosen to join the team that implemented agrarian reform activities in the province of Bulacan, Batangas, and Bataan. The experience from this stints become the foundation of his innovative approach in solving social and agrarian problems of the small farmers. From here, he then become became one of the pioneers of a multinational company that introduced new grades of inorganic fertilizers and agricultural chemicals in the Philippines. Eventually, he was asked to start and manage the agricultural holdings uh, of the biggest pharmaceutical conglomerate. This key position led him to the corridors of power, particularly when he was conscripted by the Philippine government to handle the development of ancestral and tribal settlements of the national minorities. Our speaker or our panelist establishes real estate development companies that specialize in setting up of leisure and residential communities, beach resorts, and uh, memorial parks. To date, uh, Billy is a trustee of the Coalition for Agricultural Modernization of, Philippine, uh, of Philippines or CAMP and an active director of the UP College of Agriculture and Food Sciences Alumni Association. He's presently involved as chairman with a number of business enterprises such as the Costa de Madera Corporation, Pueblo Nino Development Incorporated, Farmers Bazaar, FinTech Philippines, Obra Palma Land Holdings Incorporated, Oro Palma Processing Company, and the owner of Pueblo Organic uh, veg Vegetables and Fruit Farm. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, to present to us this morning about the hub and spoke concept and how it can be used toward high value processing and capacity building for our local farmers and business entities in the coconut industry and hopefully uh, in strengthening the UPLB alumni industry linkage. Let us all welcome Crisanto S. Gualberto II. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, uh, Dr. Michael Lorio. Thank you, Dr. Myra Berlines, for the, the link. Firstly, I would like to congratulate Chancellor Dong Camacho, UPLBAA President Manny Baradas, 
National Scientist MLQ Javier, UP Regent Francis Laurel, Dr. Cel Habito, Dr. Reste Culliado, Dr. Rex Navarro, for collectively spearheading this initiative of forging an active interaction among the alumni of UPLB, the industry stakeholders, and the University of the Philippines, Los Baños. This signature activity will open the floodgates of symbiotic cooperation among the mentioned parties, which will bring beneficial results to our people, the economy, and our country. On a very short notice, I was asked to speak on the subject of operational linkages among dimension groups. Let me approach this task by aligning the substance of my presentation with what my colleagues at the Coalition of Agricultural Modernization or CAM, headed by Dr. Emil Javier, Academician Dong Racho, and Dr. Ben Texon are passionately pushing hand in hand with my business partners who are translating our business models into fruition for reality. Permit me to use the current state of our coconut industry as the entry point of my presentation. We are faced right now with the following challenges. What can be done to resuscitate and revitalize the moribund coconut industry? What can the academy do to hasten the recovery of the industry? How can the alumni of the best agricultural school of the country expedite the process? How can the industry stakeholders sustain the regeneration of this industry? Presently, we are confronted with the following facts. We have 3.5 million farmers who are totally dependent on coconuts. Most of them are the poorest among the poor. We have 3.5 to almost 4 million hectares that are planted to coconuts, but 50% of the standing coconut trees are senile. Copra, which is a century-old product, is still the dominant product of our coconut farmers. The government have not fully supported uh, uh, I will use this slide on cue. The government have not fully supported the coconut industry, and this can be fully attested with facts and figures. The supply and value chain attached to the coconut industry is fragmented and more open than not disconnected. Most of the processing technologies used by existing processing firms here have not been modernized and as such are processing technologies that need to be updated. There is an inequitable value allocation to the raw material suppliers, which are the farmers. Which of these situations, our, uh, with these situations, I mean, our quest for a business model that can handle coconuts from 25,000 to 50,000 hectares in five to 10 locations in the country were met with difficult challenges on the source of energy, source of water, availability of fuel for logistical purposes, and the disposable and the disposal of waste. Our original business model also called for the empowerment of the coconut farmers to improve their status of being just raw material suppliers to that of becoming 30 to 40% equity owners of the processing facility. This process needed the full support of the government banks to extend loans to the farmers to free them from their encumbered land holdings from the mortgages with traders and other money lenders, with the enterprise as co-maker to assure payment in a period of not more than five years. Unfortunately, 
the government development banks were not prepared to accommodate this financial arrangement. As we were overtaken by this pandemic, we scaled down our business model into a more manageable platform that is attuned to the present challenging situation. Now, can let me now can I have the uh, slides, please? Let me share with you the hub and spoke business model. All right, we have the uh, the business model we patterned after the hub and the spokes. And this is under the company that I formed with my partners, Cobra Palma. Next slide, please. Agriculture is a vital industry in the Philippines. And yet, as we have commonly and open said, it is neglected. Filipino farmers suffer from very weak bargaining power and a lack of genuine support. Next slide, please. Filipino farmers suffer with no food and financial security due to the lack of high value storage facilities and value added processing technologies. This gives them no control in selling their own harvest. Next slide, please. This is the schematic uh, diagram or presentation of a hub and spoke. You have the hub at the center and the spokes around and supporting the hub. The spokes can be situated to as far as 200 kilometers away from the hub. The perfect example of what we are doing is that our hub, the first hub, the first hub that we are doing right now is in Laguna, in Santa Rosa at Laguna Techno Park. And we have started putting up our spokes, one in Mulanay, the other one is in Baler, the other one will be in Oriental Mindoro, and the other one will be in San Juan Batangas. And each hub can be supported by a maximum of about 10 spokes. Next slide, please. The spoke, it brings jobs to the people at the farm where they are needed most. Instead of bringing people to the city where they are needed least. Next slide, please. What is a spoke? A spoke is a, a local uh, processing plant that accepts uh, uh, farm harvest of raw materials, primarily coconuts, mangoes, dairy, and converts them into semi-finished goods. These intermediary goods are then shipped daily for further processing at the main hub. Spokes can harvest many items, including meaning process, many items, including young coconut water, coconut meat, coconut sap, uh, dairy cow, cow's milk, uh, water buffalo's milk, goat milk, calamansi juice, squash, assorted vegetables, and other fruits. Each spoke will be partnered with the farmers and local entrepreneurs. And they will be built right where the raw materials are coming from, right at the heart of the Philippine farmlands. Next slide, please. The spoke and the hub can only be possible if the intermediary goods like coconuts, and the like, can be preserved safely for transportation to the hub. And this calls for advanced technologies on product preservation. Our new innovations will allow cost-effective ways to preserve the intermediary goods at fraction of the cost. Next slide, please. We project that each spoke will create at least 200 new jobs and can serve 2,000 farmers, more or less. And it can contribute to the local economy, to the local community, about 400 million pesos a year. Each spoke. Next slide, please. Each spoke 
uh, if it's going to uh, process coconuts, young coconuts, for example, will be able to process 2,000 kilos of young coconut meat and about 10,000 liters of coconut water. This will then be transferred daily to the hub using high value logistics for further processing. Each spoke guarantees intermediary goods, revenue, and resources to the hub. Next slide, please. The hub. The hub incorporates leading technology and process innovation so that uh, we can compete effectively globally. Next slide, please. The hub is the central facility in a spokes network that processes intermediary goods. And the hub utilizes high value processing technologies such as individually quick frozen, like UF or MST, which is the millisecond technology. The hub is also dedicated to value added storage facilities, including dry refrigerated, frozen, and controlled atmosphere storage. Controlled atmosphere storage means dealing with carbon dioxide, nitrogen, oxygen, humidity, special gases like uh, ethylene. And uh, the controlled atmosphere in the hub can preserve mangoes for at least two months without rotting. Apples can be preserved for a year. Next slide, please. The hub will have a high value processing uh, unit and uh, the value added processing equipment secures stabilization, reduction and preparation of young coconut meat and other products that can also be processed into pie, peelings, uh, puree, slices, and others that are needed in the food industry. Next slide, please. We will be equipped with the millisecond technology, which is a new patented pasteurization technique that processes liquid using proprietary techniques of negative pressure plus below pasteurization level heat that prolong the shelf life of milk and juices to around 90 days. Next slide, please. This is the individually quick uh, freezing uh, technology machine. And it freezes fruits and vegetables in whole. And, and it is in the process form at 60 degrees centigrade which is a groundbreaking technology. While the technology has been here for almost 10, 15 years, this is the only time that uh, this is the only moment that it's going to be used extensively on uh, fruits, vegetables, and juices. Next uh, slide, please. Each hub will be able now to help generate about 2,000 new jobs with the support of the spokes. And the part total number of farmers will not be less than 20,000 farm, farming families. And it can generate about 200 million pesos a year that will add, that will be added to our economy. Next slide, please. Each hub will deliver daily about 20,000 kilos of coconut meat if we are going to process nothing but coconut meat, meaning young coconut meat, and coconut water coming from young coconuts to about 100,000 liters. Mind you, this is not an old product in the world market. It is a new product because the uh, most of the coconut water in the world market comes from matured coconut coconuts. Based on the hub operations with 10 satellite spokes, this represents only about 80% of the total capacity of the hub. 
And the product of the hub will be exportably high value finished products. Next slide, please. Our model is a system of high value processing and logistics to sell Filipino farmers harvest at premium prices. This allows every farmer who works in this business to expect and earn a higher value and more stable income. We have been spoke, next slide please. The hub will manage the data from all the spokes. The seamless inventory and data management system will not allow the distance between the spoke to be a barrier to the system. With this simple presentation of the hub and spoke, we hope to turn the dream of the Filipino farmers into reality. Next slide, please. Thank you for uh, that presentation, uh, for that uh, uh, slide presentation, for watching that. Now, let me go back to the challenges that I posed earlier. What can be done to resuscitate or revitalize the coconut industry? We, with this business model, are confident that our our approach, the hub and spokes, can create the spark that can ignite the revival of the coconut industry due to the following reasons. First, the capital and operating requirement for the spoke and for, for each spoke is comparatively very small as compared to the putting up of the likes of existing processing plants. Second, the utilization of advanced and modern processing technologies that assures high value quality products and sustainable export market volume will allow the seamless growth of the platform. The inclusion of the coconut farmers as equity owners of the processing facility or the spoke that can process intermediary products which will assure them of higher stable income, will generate active involvement of the farmers in adding value to the new materials that they produce, to the raw materials that they produce. Our global marketing network can get bankable purchase orders that will ensure robust financial cash flows. We will also undertake massive planting of high yielding coconut hybrids and varieties to replace the senile trees, especially on the farmers who are part of this platform. By products and waste materials of the processing units will be turned into saleable products to augment the income of the stakeholders. How can the alumni of the UPLB help. They can be part or organize the coconut farmers and assist in the clustering of farms in their respective communities. They can invest, operate, manage the local processing units. They can conduct extension services to equip the farmers with the knowledge of good agricultural and management practices. They can pass track the replacement of senile trees with the high yielding dwarf hybrids. But we need the help of the UPLB. How can UPLB enhance the recovery? Let me cite Dr. Pons Batugal, a renowned alumnus of the UPLB, a coconut scientist, a farmer, a stalwart of the World's Coconut Congress, frantically warned of the imminent danger that confronts the coconut industry. He said, we have to replace our senile trees so that we can be assured of a sustainable raw material supply. Today, PCA can only produce about 2 million seed nuts a year. 
Dr. Batugal said, as of yesterday, the country needs 500 to 600 million seed nuts to support the stride in processing technologies being done and achieved by the industrial sector. That is a great challenge. You at UPLB must now take the cudgels for leadership if really it would like to be the leader in the bioagro technical field in urgently establishing the, the facility that can produce or propagate 8,000 to 10,000 plantlets per coconut plumule through somatic embryogenesis or tissue culture. Bear in mind that our capability right now, the technology that we have in producing coconut plantlets is pegged down to about 200 plantlets per plumule. The details of this endeavor should now be tackled with haste. It will take a long discussion to attach ourselves to this endeavor, but this is a great challenge for the UPLB. Other activities involving researches, extension, and product development must also go hand in hand with what can be handled by UPLB. On the other hand, the industrial sector must embrace the adoption and utilization of new processing technologies. This task needs timely updating and acquisition of new and modern processing equipments. Adjunct facilities like cold storage, logistical infrastructure must be provided by the industrial sector to assure product preservation and quality. The industrial sector must soften the lukewarm attitude of the development banks in extending financial and credit facilities to the farmers and their localized processing ventures. Industry must continuously work for the growth and expansion of global marketing network to absorb the improved processed products. These tasks that I've mentioned are not easy to achieve. However, with a focused and concerted effort from the triumvirate, the gear will start to roll and grind and reasonable results will be realized. And soon, the appropriate emancipation, emancipation of the farmers, the poorest among the poor, will be achieved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sir Billy, for that uh, interesting talk. And thank you for sharing the various areas in the hub and spoke concept and model to revitalize particularly the Philippine coconut industry. Now, we hope that UPLB can adopt such model and uh, be able to address the challenges that you pose, including the um, not only in um, developing modern processing technologies, and uh, development of new products or commodities for our farmers, but also to include the farmers into the picture. Likewise, I hope that this um, presentation also pose a challenge to the alumni and industry uh, to co-facilitate and, as you said, embrace the modernization of agricultural production in overcoming the limitations in this sector. So thank you very much, Sir Billy, for that. And for our participants, again, uh, we are uh, we, we remind uh, that for question and answer, just type in your questions and clarifications as well your, as well as your inputs uh, to this uh, program in the QA Q and A box below. Um, also, we are live in Facebook, not only in Zoom. So here we are currently at 101 participants. And in Zoom earlier, um, I was uh, informed that there are 24 uh, viewers uh, in FB Live, via FB Live. So let's continue to share uh, the live stream to our UPLB fellow alumni uh, so that we could expect more inputs from, uh, from them. 
And so to continue with our program, let me introduce the next speaker. So our next speaker is Agustin Gus, or Gus B. Molina Jr. He is a world-renowned banana scientist whose career transcended from the hallowed halls of the academe to the practical fields of industry and challenges of the International Agricultural Research for Development System. After obtaining his bachelor's and master's degrees 1973 and in 1979 from UPLB, Dr. Molina continued his graduate studies at the Pennsylvania State University, where he obtained a degree of Doctor of Philosophy in Plant Pathology in 1983. His early career as a researcher of UPLB brought impact to rice and corn, the most, two most important food crops in the Philippines. His career continued to the practical fields of the private corporate sector when he joined Chiquita Brand, Brands International Incorporated in Central America in 1985. After 10 years of productive industry career, he rejoined the Philippine Academy as an associate professor and chairman of the Department of Plant Pathology of the College of Agriculture and later was appointed as the Vice Chancellor for Research and Extension of UPLP. Dr. Molina joined Bioversity International, a research development for development CGIR, IAR Center in 1998 and actively led the regional and global research efforts of Bioversity International, including addressing important banana pests and diseases, production systems, conservation, and use of banana genetic diversity in Asia and the Pacific region through the Banana Asia Pacific Network or BAPNET. Dr. Molina's significant contributions to banana R4D is duly recognized and appreciated by the Philippine banana industry sector. His outstanding research and development contributions are also recognized by his peers, alma mater, and the community and has been given outstanding distinctions both locally and internationally to share with us how he had a collaborative public private r4d that saved our philippine banana industry and how this engaged strategic partners including uplb in the impact pathway let us all welcome dr Agustin b malina jr sir Gus. good morning Maraming salamat sa organizers and uh, uh, mga participants dito sa webinar. Um, I am very uh, privileged to be part of this uh, UPLB uh, or Academ University Alumni and Industry uh, Summit. And um, uh, I'm glad that uh, the previous presenters have uh, presented the very good models, very good, good models on uh, agribusiness. And uh, I would like to start uh, uh, from the statement of uh, Pablito, my good friend, Pab, uh, Pabs. And he says, severe disconnect between the academe, UP, and the agro-based industry, farmers, and the fisher folks. And I've heard that for many, many, many times, not only for UP, but uh, the, the whole research system in the uh, Philippines. And so my topic today is uh, not giving you a business model, but a topic that would be relevant to the academy, to the researchers and to the alumni. Uh, based on my experiences in three different sectors. From the academy, I worked for the university for 15 years. I worked for corporate sector in Latin America for 10 years and 20 years in the uh, international agricultural research sector. So uh, my topic is... Uh, entitled Research for Development as uh, uh, Towards Impact. We have heard um, um, about R&D. It's, it's a term that's commonly used. In this case, I will use research for development because 
it's a strategy that focused towards development. It has developmental goal rather than academic goal. Research activities outputs are integrated in the impact pathway towards development. So that is my uh, topic today. And I will talk about my uh, 40 years experience in the three sectors, but focus on the research approaches that I have done um, in uh, the three um, research that I believe had created impact where research, basic research, had been used relevantly in the impact pathway. So I'll talk about banana pusarium wheel and bananas while I was with Biodiversity International, banana black sigatoka with Chiquita brands, and my earlier research on Philippine corn down in mildew. Now, uh, just to give you um, an overview of how important the, the disease that we work with, uh, I work with uh, in the Biodiversity International, uh, I'd like to give you an overview of what had happened in the banana industry through the decades and century, I would say. That uh, if you remember, those people who have taken um, courses in plant pathology, a classic disease, uh, that destroys the banana uh, of a crop that can destroy the economy of countries. You have heard about Panama disease. Panama disease is a disease that wiped out the uh, Cavendish industry in, the, in Central America in the 50s. And it was uh, painfully replaced by a new variety. It had changed the value chain uh, system uh, from gross Michel to resistant uh, variety Cavendish that was resistant to race one. And this was in the, uh, in the mid fifties. And since then Cavendish has been uh, the choice of varieties for export bananas, including the ones that we have in the Philippines. Now in 1990, uh, in 1990, I, I, I know this uh, very well because I was still the director of uh, research of Chiquita. We tried to establish plantations in Indonesia and Malaysia to compete, <laughs> unfortunately, <laughs> aiming to compete in the supply of uh, bananas in the growing uh, Asian market that uh, included Middle East, so established plantations. But in two to three years, these plantations were wiped out and so abandoned. So I know how uh, devastating this disease is. So when I joined uh, Biodiversity International in 1998, uh, we worked on the basis of networking, working with partners and um, uh, I was the coordinator of the Asia Pacific Network of Biodiversity International, the Banana Asia Pacific Network. And in mind of the importance of disease that may destroy the industry in not only the Philippines, but in the whole world globally. So uh, I prioritize the research on Fusarium oil as uh, an agenda, collaborative agenda of the Banana Asia Pacific Network. And if you can see that in 19, this was 2004, I organized a network which I chaired, a network that is headed by uh, um, the members of the steering committee are leaders of NARS of all the countries in Asia Pacific, uh, uh, tropical Asia Pacific. Uh, I was so into, I was very much interested into it because uh, it touches something very important in me because I'm a Filipino and I was based in the Philippines at Iri at the time and with immense experience in the industry about the banana industry. So I thought that um, we have to address this because it threatens the very survival of our Cavendish industry. At that time, we had 82,000 hectares and mostly monoculture of one variety, which makes it very vulnerable to uh, these diseases. These plantations were uh, grown or operated mainly by multinationals, big plantations like uh, Dole, Del Monte, Sumipro, and a uh, few big Filipino um, company owners like uh, Tadeco, Lavandai, and others. But there is that 30% participants 
from small independent growers. When we say independent growers, small independent growers, they own about five hectares, 10 hectares, up to 500 hectares, and they have their own marketing uh, system or a, 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 a different supply chain. And uh, it is so important because this industry is a major uh, foreign exchange earner. It is the number two after coconut, of course, uh, agricultural export uh, from uh, in the Philippines, and it provided it provides more than four hundred thousand direct employment in southern Philippines. Not to mention service providers uh, that are, that also provide give in a, um, provide the, uh, employment to them. Uh, just a brief history of uh, tropical race war. It first appeared in two thousand in the highlands of uh, Mindanao. And uh, it increased uh, uh, epidemic uh, in the lowland because banana plantations are uh, grown mainly in the lowland. At one time, they, uh, they started planting in the highland for sweeter bananas, and that's where it started. And by 2011, 2000, uh, thousands of hectares affected and abandoned. Now, initially, the industry was reluctant to collaborate uh, in research. Uh, to address this problem, because traditionally the Cavendish or the export industry are self-sufficient. They have their own research uh, organization. I know that because I was once in, in Latin America, and um, they thought that they can manage uh, this disease. And uh, they always uh, work on the issue of uh, on the on a climate of confidentiality, especially the big uh, big growers. So they did not, at first they they were reluctant to collaborate with public institutions like us. Um, but since I they knew that I was uh, also competent in this area, eventually when they saw the um, destruction of the farms, they eventually. Uh, um, um, collaborated with us. Now, when I talk of R4D, whenever we do research, we have to have an aim. Whatever we do, there ma we must think of what is the next step and what uh, does it contribute to development? Not uh, just simply because I do it because it's, I'm a plant pathologist and I can publish something like that. So the first study that I perform uh, with partners is to identify the nature of the epidemic because they, they did not believe that it is tropical race war, which is the most uh, virulent uh, race. It's just like COVID. You have to, you have to identify whether COVID or not uh, to convince that you have to be treated or uh, isolated or so forth and so on. So this research that I've done in early 2000 when people were very reluctant um, or skeptic uh, was the key basic research that convince my objective in doing this is to convince the industry to invest and conduct research uh, to mitigate these uh, dreaded problems and um, not for publication I, I i publish this also but it's not ma mainly for publication but rather to convince people to act collaboratively to address this disease but when you think of uh, addressing this disease like COVID, what do you have? Do you have vaccines? Do you have uh, therapeutics and so forth and so on? Unfortunately, in the banana industry, um, breeding for bananas is very difficult. I know that because when I was working with Chiquita, we invested millions, 10 millions every year to breed for a banana resistant to black cigatoka. At the end, we were not able to, to produce anything because it's uh, seedless, it's difficult. Um, and we have a specific objective of, to produce uh, Cavendish, which is uh, the one required by the, uh, by the market. But in Bapnet, my uh, our advantage was that I was coordinating a network where we collaborate by sharing resources, sharing information. And the Taiwan Banana Research Institute uh, had the problem of tropical race for uh, years back. And in order for them to survive, they did research on selection, prosomoclonal selection. That is a form of mutation breeding. And in the ninth, they already have the varieties. And uh, I use my leverage as a coordinator of the Asia Pacific Network, I was able to convince the Council of Agriculture of Taiwan and the Taiwan Banana Research Institute to share with us these varieties. So we didn't have to reinvent wheels, but uh, um, take advantage of what our networks had. So 
Uh, from that uh, sharing, I conducted or uh, I coordinated a multi-stakeholder research that involved uh, universities, um, research institutions, and the and uh, at that time the only company that was very receptive to us, and that is uh, uh, mid 2000 Isla Fund Approach Corporation, um, because they were the ones uh, affected. And uh, uh, it was coordinated by Biodiversity. I in, uh, engaged Picard, DA, but also for uh, funding. And so we did a series of experimentation or field testing, replicated trials, etc. And eventually, when something uh, I when something was coming up uh, relevant or significant, I went to another another partner in in the pathway. That is scaling out with banana growers. So it's you can see the the, the direction of that uh, developmental goal from basic research to um, uh, that included the different uh, partners, and then went back I, to I went to the industry, the user, because they are the ones to uh, adapt, and uh, they must be convinced that it really works. So it. That is along the pathway. And I'm glad to say that by 2014, we already had selected a variety, evaluated in many sectors, and it was adapted for commercialization by big companies. Dole, for instance, in 2018, they already had 4,000 hectares. Tadeco, um, uh, Sumipro, uh, Del Monte, all of them had readily adapted the, the technology that we had developed with them. And um, so that's how we developed the, 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 the technology. It started from basic research, and there was an objective for that, to make actions, and then a series of uh, research activities engaging different partners. And during that, during that um, uh, research uh, the, uh, of that development, we also included the market. We have to do research in quality or acceptance in the market. It's no longer the universities. It's already with the industry. So I made sure that it goes through the process, the whole process of impact or value chain and uh, until the adoption. Now, my problem right now, well, not actually a problem, but the issue that I'm raising right now is that, yes, the big companies can easily adapt because they have the infrastructure and resources to do that. But how about the small Cavendish growers? Who help them? The big companies, they have their research organization. They pay quite well, and they can easily, they can easily adapt technologies. But the small Cavendish growers are the ones that are that need uh, um, assistance. One of the specific uh, limitations of the small farmers is the insufficient quality of seedling supply, seed system, produ production inputs, and they have problems in the market. Now, what is the role of government and universities? Do we, can we do something as a university? in helping them. Yes, we can. There are still research uh, issues that have to, to be addressed, like, for instance, uh, efficient use of, uh, of propag propagation of uh, planting materials that they cannot uh, have. They do not have facilities of uh, nurseries, unlike the one in uh, Dole, for instance. You can see the uh, this picture of a sea of uh, uh, use of uh, Tissue culture, tissue culture. Now, last week I read in the newspaper about uh, this one, the new roadmap of the government that they will spend four billion to hike banana output. Four billion on on the roadmap, and uh, my question is, how can UPLB? How, how do we participate in the roadmap? What are the real R and D issues? that we can address based on our capacity as a university. We cannot assume that we can address all the developmental problems that, that, um, that uh, my friend Pablito and, uh, and my friend uh, Billy have uh, enumerated. We can only work on the basis of our competence, our nature. So we have to identify that. 
And what are the real R&D issues for small-scale growers? And how much could be addressed by research? How about policy? Market is policy. We are we our our mar, uh, market in Japan and other in Korea are more expensive because of tariff. Can that be addressed by research in the university? Of course not. The main player are policymakers. Now, this is a very interesting uh, Billy. I, I put you here. Uh, you have a picture there. You see that one. That is Billy Gualberto. In the budget, it says that they will spend 2.5 billion on Cavendish, but they also call for allocation of 74, 741 million and 806 million for Lakatan and Sabah industry plants. To tell you the truth, my personal opinion is that we should invest more on Lakatan and Sabah because it engages the livelihood of many small farmers. And if we want to, uh, to follow the, the, the model of, uh, of Billy, Sabah is a very good uh, crop for, uh, for value adding. Now, the main problem to tell, the main problem of small growers of Lakatan and Sabah is the availability of seedlings. You see, Billy started with Lakatan and uh, he bought uh, this Lakatan through my, uh, through my advice from Dabao. And he established a very good nursery and uh, he, his crop was, uh, he had a very good crop. But the problem is there is no sustainability of planting materials for Lakatan, much less for Sabah. The reason is that Sabah is not like Cavendish that you can produce uh, from one meristem to 1,000, 1,000 seedlings. Sabah is a very recalcitrant uh, uh, variety, and this is where the uh, this is where the research should come in. This is where this competence of UPLB scientists should come in. The problem that I observe in all this uh, research in the universities, not only UPLB but everywhere, is that when they are given uh, the money on tissue culture, they want to produce and sell. They serve as the, 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 the businessmen themselves rather than using their capabilities to improve the efficiency of producing seedlings for the farmers, for the private sector to adapt as, uh, 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 as an industry. Universities are not good, are not good in business, but our role is to produce technology that will be used by in business players. And that is why I'm very passionate in this kind of, 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 of discussion because uh, uh, really we have to, we will always be commented on as irrelevant unless we, we, we change our uh, way of doing business. Okay, you might notice that in doing that, and I was the lead coordinator as because of uh, that is my expertise. I engaged so many partners, local, the company, universities, and international partners. And, um, and we did, uh, most of the, my partners in the, in the Philippines were alumni of the university, so that's why I was very uh, successful in that. Okay, so that is uh, my uh, R4D in the bananas. I would like to uh, mention a little bit on my experiences in corporate uh, R&D. As I said, I worked for 10 years with them as scientist and also a director of, of research of a $5 billion annual revenue company. When I was hired, they have a problem, the disease Black Sigatoka, and still a problem all throughout the world. At that time, they managed it with fungicide. Up to now, it's still managed by fungicide, $1,000 hectare dollar per hectare per year. And we had 100,000 hectares. So you can make your arithmetic uh, or calculation, how much money is that? And they hired me as a scientist because I'm an epidemiologist. I, they hired me for that, to develop a control measure. And um, that practices cannot be done without basic research. You have to do research. That's why I'm emphasizing research is needed for innovation. You cannot, the fundamental basis of innovation is research, but you have to do a research that is relevant. And you are, 
you are clear of the of the things where you're going. So I did uh, epidemiological studies. If it was COVID, I studied saan ang inokula, sino, ilang, ilang araw, how, how far from the, when somebody sneezes, hanggang saan yung, yung particulate, ano ang uh, dispersal, is it airborne, uh, saan ang na-infection, sa nusba o sa paa or whatever. I did all that and what are the factors that affect this disease development? Those are basic questions that I had to answer, and if I had to to publish all this research, I would be I would have published so many kinds of uh, research in scientific journals. What was the outcome? My objective was to develop a predictive system of fungicide application, a more effective way so that I can uh, control the disease better, and if we do that. What, and exactly what I did was to redu, uh, to do uh, to develop that, and we reduced the cost from one thousand hectare to six hundred uh, dollars per hectare, and that meant a forty million dollar a year reduction. And well, although I did not have any publication, the company uh, awarded me a presidential award and some. Uh, a little bit of monetary monetary uh, 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 price. So that is how we work in the corporate industry. You do you do your research because they recognize that research is good for innovation, but you do it for a purpose that uh, uh, promote development. Okay. Uh, finally, this one is uh, Philippine corn down in mildew. In the in the 1980s, before 1980s. We cannot grow hybrid in the Philippines because of the of the so-called Philippine corn, corn downy mildew, and there was no cost of uh, fungicide. There was no uh, hybrid at that time, and so there was a product of uh, Sibagaygi, Rido Mill, and um, they came to us in 1977, and they recommended 2,500 grams per hectare uh, per spray. In spite of that, it was not effective. But this is where a basic research come in. If you are a scientist, you have to know what other people have done rel relative to your objective. Dalmatio and Exconde in 1969, they do, did uh, epidemiological studies and they have established that kung, as soon as the world gets out of the ground, yung sporangia, a sporangium ng pathogen will get into the world and it causes systemic infection and patay na talaga yung, yung halaman mo. So sabi ko, if that's the case, then we have to protect the seeds, seedlings before it comes out from the ground. And therefore, treating the seeds was a logical treatment method as uh, since it is a systemic. So my thesis was, uh, you say, pala or sa timba or sa plastic bag, even the uh, cement mixer. And you know what? This is the result. It's a day and night. The untreated, 100% infected, redomil treated was, yeah. So, si Bagaygay uh, convinced, uh, was convinced and alam mo yung mga um, companies, they are smart. Because, uh, kasi 150 grams na lang, instead of 2,500 grams. So they changed the, the, the formulation, nilagyan nila ng kaunting color upang magiging makita kung alin ang treated. And of course, they increased the price. So, up to now, the April 35 SD was, it paid the hybrid corn industry. Kung meron kayong nakikita mga hybrid corn dyan, it's simply because of, of metalaxyl. Without it, it cannot, it, cannot be, it cannot survive. And my advisor, actually, it was a breakthrough. Uh, my advisor, Dr. Exunde, was given, uh, and project leader given the Pro Patria Award uh, by President Marcos. Okay. Going now to a little bit, uh, please uh, give me a little time on this. My thoughts on research in the academy. You know, the nature of academy, we have a culture of academic freedom. We are free thinkers, so to speak. And therefore, we in the universities are supply-driven research from deep resources of scientists, meaning napakarami tayong experts sa university. We gra graduate tayo sa iba't ibang university sa state. May molecular biologists, may epidemiologists, etc., etc. E ano ang you expect us to produce? Kung saan ang competence natin? And these are influenced by our motivations, the reward systems. I've been saying this. 
if your promotion, tenure, and job security, financial return, and even fame is dependent on publications, anong gagawin mo? You have to produce volume, you know, volume of, of, of publications. Ito, nakita ko yung, yung caricature sa kanan. Maganda ito. I think we have to think about that. Solving valid problem in the academia. Yung mahirap po, tignan po, naglalakad lang, nag-iisa siya. Not so many of us do that. And saan tayo? Nandoon sa escalator, napakarami for rapid publication. That is the fact. That is the fact. We, we do not accept it, but that is the fact. Now, reference scientific publication, mostly from basic research. Eh, mag-submit ka sa uh, international journal na mayroong mataas na index. Uh, eh, kung yung mga kailangan mo ng basic research yan. And therefore, the, uh, the, your research is more based on the outputs rather than the impact. They are fragmented. And uh, the university, as I said, is a bastion of highly competent scientists focused on strategic and basic research. Research outputs are either not relevant to the industry or failed to be pursued to the next steps in the value chain. That is important. Hindi ko naman sinasabi na yung mga research natin ay uh, hindi lahat mag uh, maganda. Yung basic research, there are very good basic research, pero it is not brought up to the, to the impact pathway. Hindi natin sinusundan. Ang ginagawa mga scientists natin, kung, kasi yun ang expertise niya, paulit-ulit, yun pa rin, pero hindi yan, it does not go to the impact pathway. While, and also this one, it's not only a problem of the university, while many criticize the university, uh, if the industry also has a share, it takes two to tango. Kasi kung yung industry habang wala silang problema, ay hindi sila lumalapit sa'yo. At in fact, ayaw pa nga nila sa atin. So there must be a meeting of the a meeting of objectives and uh, so there, uh, the industry and the uh, and the academy should meet uh, to address an industry problem uplb alumni in the academy and in the industry can work together to make university research more relevant and useful to the industry uplba can serve as a catalyst and this synergy will certainly enhance the research and extension and instruction mandate mandate of uplb I always say, uh, yeah, I said, impact of R4 scientific output is measured not how much, how many have read your publication or knowledge, but on how many have used the technologies, the tools, and practices that came out of your research. You know. Um, I, 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 uh, proud ako na may, may ipakita ito kasi all my research for development were recognized. Itong nandun sa taas uh, is very uh, fulfilling because it is the industry that used the technology that given me a special citation that is from the Phil Export and PBJ uh, in, in 2018. And of course, in, 19, in 1977, the CEO and president of Chiquita Brands gave me a very uh, a presidential award in 77. So that's it. Maraming salamat sa inyong lahat sa pakikinig ninyo. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Sir Gus, for that interesting talk. And as a researcher in UPLB myself, I am also challenged by making my research relevant for the university, but also for the developmental purposes. Somehow I have seen your uh, vision of reshaping uh, UPLB research and development into research for development, where one uh, moves forward to not only uh, doing research for publication, but rather to move forward with applying research results in developmental efforts. And the alumni and industry can provide support uh, so that the research can go up the impact pathway. So thank you very much for that. Um, and uh, in the interest of time, uh, we already have questions uh, that are piling up in our Q&A box. So I would like to um, request the uh, panelists to, um, to look into the Q&A box and uh, try to answer some of, the, some of the questions. You may also opt to answer live uh, during the open forum later, all right? And for those who have... Uh, questions, you can still type in your Q&A or rather your questions, um, inputs in the Q&A box. 
So on to our uh, last but not the least panelist speaker. So our fourth panelist for today's webinar, Michael Kurt Roiber, has been in the freight forwarding industry for over 45 years and is the chairman of the board and group chief executive officer of the Philippines' first multinational freight forwarding company, and now one of the leading names in the logistics in the country, Royal Cargo Incorporated. Mr. Roiber ventured into freight forwarding projects and heavy lift operations, contract logistics, express customs, clearance, uh, liquid transportation, ISO tank, and flexi tank operations. Through his leadership, the company has established itself as a leader in these industries in the country. Now, the company has offices in the United Kingdom, USA, China, Singapore, Hong Kong, Vietnam, Cambodia, Palau, Malaysia, and Thailand. As a pioneer in the freight forwarding industry, our panelists shall provide his expertise on developing high quality and cost-efficient specialized logistic solutions and his perspective in integrating them in agricultural production. Unfortunately, Mr. Roiber won't be able to join us today in the webinar. Nonetheless, joining on his behalf is Mr. Jet Tuan, the Chief Revenue Officer of Royal Cargo Incorporated. Like Mr. Roiber, Mr. Pamintuan is also one who has fared the freight forwarding industry for quite some time, specifically for over 24 years. He started his career in 1997 as an account manager with DHL Global Forwarding Philippines. Since then, he has taken on various commercial roles and more recently as head of regional business customer sales channel for the Asia Pacific at DHL Singapore Regional Office. He, re he relocated with his family back to the Philippines and joined Royal Cargo in 2017. In his latest role at Royal Cargo as Chief Revenue Officer, he is accountable for driving integration and alignment between all revenue generating functions such as marketing, sales, um, customer support, and sales support function. Here to present to us the role of agri-logistics in value adding to the Philippine agriculture supply chain, let us all welcome the Chief Revenue Officer of the Royal Cargo Incorporated, Mr. Jet Pamintula. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lario. Dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Michael Roiber, RCI Chairman and Group CEO, expresses his regret for not making it to this important event due to an urgent personal matter. So I'll be presenting on his behalf, and I'd like to start with a quick introduction about uh, Mr. Roiber. Next slide, please. Okay, Mr. Roiber is European. Um, he has not lost um, his roots in Germany. And uh, he has also has deep roots in uh, the family and business here in the Philippines. Um, he arrived 47 years ago, and he's grateful for and have seen the opportunities to develop and grow um, his own business in the Philippines and has acted on those and formed a sizable, profitable group of companies with the help of friends and staff. In his view, there are always difficulties in developing new markets. Still, if you understand and analyze the hindrances with a bit of patience and understanding of the culture in this country, those problems can be overcome. The presentation uh, focuses on the logistics sector and also um, share with you how we envision Royal Cargo um, in revving up the agricultural sector and particularly how do we link up. And um, of course, we will take questions later on um, after this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so before um, we share our plans um, regarding the agri sector logistics, I would like to give a bit of um, context um, about our company. So we established uh, Royal Cargo back in 1978. Um, in uh, 2020, um, we have generated about 5.1 billion in Philippine, Philippine peso revenue. Um, and at this point, uh, as of latest, we have about 1,200 employees. We pride ourselves um, as having a company um, uh, for being entrepreneurial in our approach. And along that line, um, we have um, invested in assets. Um, this is uh, contrary to the typical uh, competition in, in freight forwarding and logistics, um, where you know, the, um, the setup, the business model is asset-like. 
Um, we have invested in warehouses um, in several locations across the Philippines. Uh, we have our own uh, container yard operations in three locations. We operate uh, three vessels. Um, and I'm going to talk about a bit more about uh, one of the vessels uh, later on in this presentation. We have um, you know, about 3,800 plus container vans in support of the shipping line operations. Um, in helping us um, deploy and distribute um, customers' products, uh, we have um, several trucks and prime movers, both owned and, uh, and subcontracted um, with our um, partners. What's also unique in our company is our uh, project management. And here we have invested heavily in crane age, uh, telehandlers, um, and different special equipment, um, which um, we use in, in project, um, project management approach. So let me um, just go on to the next slide, just to quickly show you um, our global footprint. As mentioned, we are um, present in um, around the world. Can we pride ourselves also for being the first multinational freight forwarding, a Filipino forwarding? Um, we have spread out across um, the US in California, in Europe, we have United Kingdom office, uh, and predominantly in Asia Pacific, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and, and Vietnam, with our global headquarters based in Philippines. For the rest of the markets, we are supported by our partner agents and uh, with joint venture partnership, particularly with Sumitomo, a Japanese uh, company, and Sinotrans, as you might be aware, is the largest uh, freight forwarding in the world now. Okay, so uh, with, for a Philippine point of view, as you can see, we're well-placed across the markets from the zone Visayas and Mindanao. Uh, we have 20 offices across um, and um, our head headquarters is located here in Paranaque, near the uh, Terminal 1 Maia Airport. So um, as, you can, as you can see, the footprint really um, allows us now to really um, take advantage of our footprint um, in supporting agri-sector, uh, which I will talk later on. Just to show you um, how um, we organize ourselves across um, our products and uh, services, uh, we are divided into five um, uh, sectors. We have freight forwarding, we have contract logistics that does four wall operations. I mentioned about uh, the third one, the projects and heavy lifts where we carry um, you know, heavy loads um, from factories to um, you know, uh, wind turbines, as, as you can see in the screen. Um, we have also recently entered in the shipping line business um, and, um, and where we have three vessels in operations as mentioned. We have several value added services um, as you can see, it's a conglomeration on the specialized services side um, where we have business process outsourcing as well, um, as well as specialization in life sciences. Um, very useful and um, uh, nowadays for the uh, fight against pandemic, uh, particularly in handling vaccine. So last about the introduction about Royal Cargo. Um, I wanna just uh, give you um, a spotlight about contract logistics. As you can see, most of our customers in this particular um, product and service caters to um, you know, food and agri-based uh, companies. And um, we are um, well-equipped, uh, certified, and uh, we have highlighted a few of those that, um, that uh, allows us to and, and show that we are professional and uh, we have a superior process in terms of handling, uh, properly handling agri-based um, products. We have invested in technologies, um, cloud-based systems to make sure that um, you know, we have um, accurate inventory and visibility of um, the products being, being delivered while in the warehouse and while in transit. So um, I will uh, now move on to the next um, slide uh, and to the main points. So um, the Philippine logistics industry is expected to breach past 1 trillion peso by 2024 driven by the bright economic prospects post-pandemic. The expanding population and increased spending on fresh foods and quality products, um, and also the trend, um, this trend particularly will result in continued increase uh, in e-commerce activities and the need for bigger warehouses capacities and uh, final mile deliveries. Improving road connectivity across our island nation will only accelerate further this growth path. To sustain, um, to sustain this path, um, there are crucial changes that need to take place, starting with the blue economy. 
that's particularly referring to the role of shipping in the Philippine economic growth. As a company, we started looking at the role of shipping in economic growth in 2018 and are focused on creating economic opportunities for 2021 and beyond. It now makes sense to see the shipping sector as part of the Maritime Blue Philippines economic potential and develop its capacities in good transportations within intra-Asia by the sea and flag shipping lines. Open to some degree for foreign investments, of course. The world has changed and the cost of transportation has skyrocketed. In response to ensuring an adequate space supply, the Philippines plans to create and expand its flag shipping lines to deliver its exports with Asia and other global markets. At the same time, transport cargo for Philippine companies at best prices here. A bill creating a Philippines flag registry for an international fleet of container ships is pending in Congress. So why now? Shipping in ASEAN becomes more critical after global trade is affected by the pandemic and new policies. At the same time, the intra-Asia business grew exponentially in the last decade, and Europe is looking at the ASEAN and Asia as a focus trade and investments. To make a start and point, our feeder vessel, the fully booked MV Iris Pauai, one of our vessels, has been equipped and improved to pass international standard requirements of crew and equipment. It has obtained all Philippine and United States certification for international trade. It has recently commenced its maiden voyage from Manila, Davao to Los Angeles and expected to arrive um, uh, 26th of October. Um, so, but these are very small, important steps towards showing our Philippine industry and potential investor what is possible. What I'm showing you in the screen is a highlight of the maiden voyage and um, ceremony last of August uh, 30, 2021, with Secretary Ramon Lopez as the keynote speaker and attended by our friends from USAID and Export Development Council. So another crucial component is infrastructure. Um, from the logistics point of view, um, OECD reports the cost of logistics um, to sales remain high in the Philippines, approximately about 27% higher compared to other ASEAN countries in the Philippines. And we rank about 60th in the World Logistics Performance Index um, in 2018. Customs and infrastructure are the two most challenging areas in that, um, in that survey. And um, as we know, build, build, build programs underway and um, uh, we expect the improvement in the country's infrastructure uh, as, a result, as a result of this initiative. As our company, Royal Cargo, we support the build, build, build government program through our department projects and heavy lift and heavy crane and erection departments. Um, we differentiate ourselves to competition through heavy equipment investments, local engineering know-how, development and cooperation with external foreign engineering companies, as well as internal companies. Public service is the next uh, sector uh, that's crucial uh, to logistics. In general, the amendments to the Public Service Act are required to define public utility versus public service and remove old red tape in the regulation of public services to cor control corruption and improve services. There are pending mark urgent bills with Congress promising quick change once becoming the law. With the help of ARTA, these changes will allow, will also mitigate delays in the issuance of registration certificates for equipment um, imported. A specific fundamental aim is to allow more foreign participation in public services, such as telecommunications and tra transportation, to fast track digitalization, enhance competition, improve service quality, lower the cost to farmers and consumers at large. So as a way forward, we view an integrated agri-logistics approach as the way to go. But one of the leading causes that significantly affect farmers' income is their dependency on intermediaries for machines and equipment and quick funds for seeds, fertilizers, and even family emergencies. The, result, the relationship results in the exploitation of farmers. And, um, and the other leading cause is the spoilage losses which we estimate to about 30% um, as compared to about 6% in Thailand. This is due to insufficient packaging, handling, inappropriate transportation of the products 
from farms to market. Creating a positive change requires an integrated approach in packaging, providing access to superior equipment, methodologies and supplies, storage with value added services such as individual quick freeze processing and transportation. Cooperation between Filipino and big nations such as European SMEs in this vital sector can easily create a win-win situation. European investors can provide know-how and new technologies that will benefit both Philippine and European businesses. The Philippines being part of GSP Plus uh, beneficiary, the only ASEAN country member, by the way, enjoys 0% tariff rate on over 66% of tariff lines, making Europe an attractive market for Philippine food, fruit and seafood products. To leverage on the potential mutual benefit, the EU and Philippines should strengthen cooperation in the following key areas. Trade-related capacity building, support to regulatory and enforcement institutions in ASEAN, product safety, labeling, technical standards, and sanitary and phytosanitary acceptance, mutual recognition of food product registrations, and export establishment certified by the competent national bodies. Export quality infrastructure, which includes testing laboratories and inspection agencies, and best practice customs valuation and transfer pricing frameworks for related party transactions. Okay, so Royal Cargo is developing a solution concept, which we call IQF as a service. And um, we, we, uh, the plan, according to plan, is we want to launch this within next year, um, as soon as possible. But we want, to, we want to take this in a, as a gradual approach. An initial plan really was to prove the concept by setting up buying centers for Luzon and Mindanao that will perform um, sorting and consolidation according to buyer's specification. For Mindanao, products are consolidated in a shipping container for ship out to Manila. There are two receiving facilities which are located a few kilometers outside the metro. One is the North Health facility in Bulacan, about five hectare facility. It's a sizable facility where we can house um, the um, dedicated facility for IQF and the South Hub in Laguna. So similar size, five hectares as well. And both facilities are strategically located to support the biggest market, Metro Manila, in their respective neighboring provinces and in the North and South Luzon markets. We want to start with um, primarily with mango, um, a coconut, particularly young coconuts, and, and calamansi. Um, and um, of course, the plan is to um, scale up and um, accommodate um, more capacities and, and more fruits, um, which are compatible to, to the operations of um, our concept. We are cognizant of the challenges in bringing this concept to life, and so we are engaging relevant stakeholders such as GITS, a German development agency to help with the knowledge transfer, access to the right technologies and funding support to enable participating cooperatives to this program. Our other parties involved include agri-experts such as our lead panelist today, Mr. Pabs Villegas, who provides valuable support to develop an effective approach to engaging farmers and other agri-stakeholders. We also have select companies who are buyers and exporters of fresh foods and fruit-based products. Um, with their experience and challenges, they provide us insights uh, and, and guidance on how to uh, approach the product and make it more viable and also address ultimately the challenges of um, the farmers and um, the buyers such as themselves. So as a final thought in, in, our, in my last slide, the long-term success depends on the products commercial viability. So anchoring on that, we believe that this can be achieved, but it requires entrepreneurial minded cooperatives who are willing and, and are reliable partners commit, committed to meeting the buyer's requirements in terms of quantity, quality, and time. Cooperatives, meanwhile, need both public and private support in promoting their products to broader markets here in the Philippines and in abroad. So finally, um, let us face the challenges 
and harvest all the given opportunities to overcome the sometimes grievous effects of the present pandemic towards the light of a better life for the productive people of the Philippines. Good morning and thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Jet Pamintuan. So um, thank you for sharing uh, the, the idea on logistics, on agro-logistics, and how UPLB can talk uh, alumni from the logistics industry in order to ensure that uh, consumer products go to where they are intended to go, not only in the Philippines, but also abroad. Now, at this point of the program, we are now uh, in the open forum and the panel members are ready and prepared to answer the questions from the participants and likewise um, consolidate some ideas or insights from them. Um, now, in the interest of time, uh, some of the questions in the Q&A box has already been answered. And if you want to see them, uh, you can uh, just click the Q&A icon below and go to the answer tab. Okay, so for, for our open forum today, there are questions that I think our panel members opted to answer live. Okay, so may we just um, uh, request the, the technical to highlight uh, the speakers or the panel members so that they can uh, answer. And likewise, I would like to request the panel members to open their camera for the open forum as well. Thank you very much. Okay, so I will read some of the questions uh, in the Q&A. All right, from Jimmy Nuevas, uh, BS Agriculture in 1968. Uh, Mr. Galberto with the idea uh, of Dr. Javier for the establishment of one stop shop manned by UPLB alumni plus involvement in farm clustering can facilitate entrepreneurial uh, development in the cocoa industry in Oriental Mindoro. So what are your thoughts about uh, this uh, insight, Spock? We are starting already a spokes in Oriental uh, Mindoro, particularly in uh, Pola and Victoria. There is an existing uh, BCO plant there that we are rehabilitating. And so you can contact me and I have typed my number and I can work with you in the partnerance of uh, the uh, initiative in Oriental Mindoro starting from Rojas up to Calapan, Sancho Doro and the other coconut uh, areas of Oriental Mindoro. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Um, from Mr. Neil Gonzalez uh, to Sir Gus, your concept of expanding the RDE continuum into the broader societal impact pathway beyond just the publication of journal articles as immediate outcome impact is a very laudable one. Aside from bananas, do you think this concept should be applied to other crops cultivated by small farmers? Maybe you can provide more insights on how to achieve this objective. Thank you, uh, uh, my uh, friend uh, Leo Gonzalez. Jolly Leo is my idol because we are members of the so-called uh, Ilocano Kambing uh, Group uh, Forum, and we always discuss uh, things like this. Uh, Leo, what I presented is a, a real-life experience on research, and it is a, it is a model for all researchers or whatever crop there would be. The main thing here is that uh, if we do research, it should be always so with an objective to uh, solve problems, that's uh, R4D. But yes, um, I think uh, the university uh, and the alumni associations should uh, initiate uh, a more regular and concrete uh, 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 dialogue on how um, uh, 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 R4D can be uh, uh, developed, uh, including the Department of Agriculture. Of course, so with the private sector. All right. Thank you, Sir Gus. Um, for Billy, napaka ganda ng framework, model, and your startup. Hope PCA will adopt uh, this in implementing the Coconut Levy Fund. My question is, please elaborate on how farmers' equity participation can be pursued. 
Well, we would like to empower uh, the farmers. Uh, the uh, the uh, initiative or the platform calls for not huge investment. Uh, I spoke can be started with at least 10 million pesos. And 50% of that will be equity participation coming from the farmers. Now, we would like to empower the farmers by uh, starting to uh, enlist them to invest uh, either at one time or uh, through their products, which will gradually be uh, equitized. Uh, a portion of uh, the proceeds will be equitized so that they'll be able to catch up with the equity requirement of the spokes. Now, that's the only way we can possibly enlist the farmers to really invest. Because if you ask from them immediately a huge amount, they will not be able to do that. So we have uh, done a lot of uh, uh, exploratory talks with uh, investment uh, banks. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, our government development banks are very uh, lukewarm in terms of attitude, in terms of uh, financing uh, the farmers. Hopefully, we can change this by uh, with the industry opening their their stand. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Sir Billy. Uh, Captain uh, Baradas would like to weigh into the question. Uh, can we have uh, Captain Baradas? Uh, my point to be addressed about bananas. Uh, one of the biggest uh, problem in the industry is the so-called uh, guerrilla. Bananas, no? so uh, they doesn't have the uh, uh, research group that is uh, monitoring all the uh, pests and diseases. So I think uh, it's true that uh, the guerrilla uh, banana group is the one who destroyed the uh, the the giants because every time there will be a flood, all the pathogens coming from their own farm are. Uh, impacting the, uh, the banana farms of the three giants. Um, yes, the, uh, any disease, especially for Corsarium wilt, uh, like COVID, uh, it uh, comes from sources of binocular, especially those who don't know how to take care of themselves. So most of the time, uh, small growers uh, allow uh, their, uh, they cannot control it, and that's where the disease uh, come from as an inocula. But uh, that is the uh, nature of the, of the industry. And uh, actually, the big companies are more, more proactive. They know that reality. That's why they invest a lot in terms of quarantining their own farm so that um, they can be protected from the guerrillas, as, as you said. But I'm more concerned on how can the government or uh, we as researchers help these small farmers because they are part of the of the uh, industry. Um, and what I'm worried more is they are going to disappear because they they, they cannot use the technology available for them because of uh, well lack of infrastructure and also lack of technical help. Mm -hmm. And this is where we uh, in the public sector, uh, alumni included, uh, can help. And I hope that the four billion uh, that they will put into it will not go to the big companies because they can take care of themselves, but it should go to the, uh, the many, the 30% small growers. That's my, that's my, my thinking. And the, the problem here also, Captain, is that <laughs> you know that any help, this is true, any help that comes from the government pinakamabilis na kumuha ng tulong yung mga malalakas. Yung mahina, hindi mga crumbs na lang nakukuha nila. Kaya uh, there is, this is where we should uh, be a little bit more empathic uh, from our group, the alumni or the public sector. How big is the area now in Arakan Valley? I've heard that the banana plantation is moving from Compostela Valley to Arakan Valley. The reason is that they think that this is the uh, this that area is still free from, from the disease, but that is not going to be like that because the, this disease will uh, disseminate. It will spread just like COVID. It will spread as long as people move. Uh, it carries carrying in the soil or flood water, etc. What I would like 
this is my advocacy, is that we already have a technology uh, of resistant variety. Those who can use it are those who can uh, properly use it with uh, good inputs and good, uh, good production techniques and good source of the seedlings. Unfortunately, these big companies, uh, small growers do not have a source of good quality seedlings. And um, so they are left out. Uh, the disease will be there. My, uh, my fear is that it, the, uh, the small growers will, uh, be, will disappear because of this situation. It is to the advantage, uh, uh, we have to accept it, it is to the advantage of big companies. Because after all, banana production and export are still competition. It's still a business competition in terms of supply and market. Okay, thank you, thank you. I hope there was clarity in that uh, aspect of the uh, uh, matter. Um, now this one is again for Mr. Gualberto. I like the hub. Uh, this is from Manny Logrono. I like the hub and spoke model for the coconut high value product production, uh, processing and marketing. We are also doing similar scheme in the seed industry by doing contract growing, where we guarantee a good price for the growers. How do we ensure that the spoke part will be loyal to the hub? Example, no selling to other processing companies or competitors, and adhere to the quality standards demanded by the market. Thank you, uh, Manny. Uh, uh, the reason why uh, we are equitizing or allowing the farmers to be part and parcel of the enterprise is to make sure that there will be no pole bolting, and so that we will be able to exact loyalty to the, uh, to the initiative or to the platform. When, they, when you give them a good uh, 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 profits and you, you, you improve their livelihood, uh, the farmers will stick to you. If you are honest and uh, uh, the price of the end product, the final product will also be shared. Uh, the bounties from the end product will be shared with the farmers. I am sure they will stick uh, to uh, the project, uh, to the enterprise. All right. Uh, perhaps the hub and spoke uh, model really interests our participants. And there are also uh, some of participants that are chatting in their uh, requests to Sir Billy. Um, if you may, uh, you can check the chat box and maybe uh, to some of them you could link. And pro probably for the technicals uh, in the pub materials, post webinar pub materials, we could also share the uh, contact details, at least the uh, email addresses of our panel members uh, for today's webinar. Um, now, uh, this question I goes- Dr. Mike, I will do that. I have, uh, I have with me in the question and answer box, and yes, I prefer but... to answer them. All right, all right. Okay, okay. now, um, Captain Baradas, uh, sir. No, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Resi Culliado is- oh, Dr. Resi Culliado. We have to allow him to come in. He's the chairman. <laughs> uh, I would like to congratulate the presenters uh, for the topics that they presented today. I think they are encompassing and uh, they have addressed some of the uh, issues that we alumni can participate in in our partnership with UPLB. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Molina and uh, Mr. Golberto tackled uh, two sectors of the industry that uh, need further refinement in terms of collaboration between the academe and the industry. Um, Dr. Molina was right in saying that uh, it's not the volume of research we produce, but how many of that research outputs can be applied and be used. So my question now is, uh, in the banana industry, or in, 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 uh, Dr. Dr. also as uh, in the coconut industry, what are the research gaps in these two important sectors? And in what way can the alumni participate together with the UPLB in revisiting our research agenda so that they will be responsive to the needs of the industry. Do we, can we probably, with the leadership of the UPLBAA, 
convene a group that will reformulate or not exactly reformulate, but uh, make some uh, realistic recommendations on how we can unify our research agenda towards a more specific issue or concern that the industry needs. I think I have heard comments that sometimes our research, the way we conduct research is sort of a uh, shotgun approach. There is no specific focus that we address. I don't think this is correct. I think some of our research, uh, research problems are designed to address a specific concern. But I think it will be helpful if the industry will give the EUPLB an idea of what the industry needs so that the researchers can in turn react to address a particular concern that the industry needs. In other words, let us have a good matching between the need and the ability of UPLB to supply the technology. In this, and in the, in the whole process of this, let, we can insert another concern that UPLB has. It can be a training ground for our graduating students. I'm talking about the OJT. Because if we can really link the uh, industry and the research section of the university, then the, pwede natin ipasok dun yung mga estudyante natin eh. Magkakaroon sila ng OJT. And at the same time, when we reformulate the research, binibigyan natin ang idea yung mga graduate, graduating students natin na there is a job opportunity in this. So what I'm proposing now is probably, and I think that, that's the, quest, the meat of my question is, uh, ano yung mga gaps? For example, in the industry, ano yung gap do sa binabalak ni Mr. Gualberto? While it is encompassing, I'm sure there are gaps there that UPLB can fill up. All right. Well, um, so probably that would uh, sum up for the question and answer portion. So ito yung magiging last or final question po natin para sa ating mga panel. Uh, just basically to look back on, on what our takeaways dun sa four uh, talks that we have for today and particularly um, sticking to the objective of strengthening the UPLB alumni industry linkage. So may we have um, Sir Gus? Okay, naka, uh, yeah. for, 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 In a way, my way of answering the queries uh, raised by Resti, I mentioned already that uh, when I talk of alumni, I'm talking to alumni outside the university and alumni within the university because those two groups of alumni have maybe a little bit distinct role. For us alumni in the university, we are the um, researchers and whatever research that we can do will uh, influence uh, how we link with the industry. And uh, you're right, Resti, that the university, and I mentioned in my presentation, has its own distinct nature and competence. Marami tayong mga scientists dyan. And therefore, we should, not, we should only, if maybe we cannot, if we cannot change the nature of our resources, researchers, we should take advantage of ano talaga ng strength. And we must natin doon sa kailangan ng, ng industry. And I'll give you one example, and I think this is raised by Billy also. In the coconut industry, anong kailangan natin in order to, to repopulate uh, the, the industry? Good planting materials, a mass production technique. And that requires basic research on, on in vitro culture, something, something like that. And let's challenge the, the biotechnologies in the, in the university. I am, I am pro-biotechnology, but sometimes we invest on research on biotechnology that uh, does, uh, that has a long term or we uncertain outputs but this one it has already is going to address an existing problem same thing with banana the problem in banana is the seed system seedling system like i told you that saba we, the reason we cannot grow a lot of saba by even small growers that we do not have planting materials Imagine yung picture ko na um, sakir sa tinatanim nila that is that is not good and the uh, the the constraint is because we don't have the technology to mass produce uh, uh, saba uh, so yun dapat ng ano imatch natin yung anong kailangan ng industry and Dr. Resti, Dr. Resti, uh, that question uh, pertaining to my presentation uh, the big gap is action. There is no action. 
we have to take action now, especially on the propagation, multiplication of the coconut hybrids. And we don't have to invent the wheel. All we've got to do, the university as in Taiti, as an institution, should partner with the best group now that does the somatic embryogenesis. And these are the Mexicans. And Dr. Bons Batugal can make it easy for us because he funded, he helped fund the original concept of the somatic embryogenesis that's now being done in Yucatan Peninsula. So this is an act. The, the gap is not, it's more on the action. We have to do it now. Because for the past 20 years, we have started already talking with the Yucatan people, but something went wrong. And I'll tell you why something went wrong. Because our panel, our group, the Philippine group, doesn't like to give the royalty to the Mexicans. They like to pocket it. Now we have to do action. And I believe that if it is UPLB, then there is a big reason why the, the uh, UPLB can be trusted. No? Hopefully there is no graft and corruption within the system. So UPLB should be at the forefront of this and we should do it now. We cannot rely on the government agencies in charge of the coconuts because they have done nothing for the past 50 years except produce 1 million seed nuts a year. Sir yes, I fully agree with my, uh, that's why we are very successful in uh, choosing uh, Gasolina here and uh, maybe Primo Billy to, to be part of this uh, elaboration of uh, the business models I presented. Yung uh, irresti kasi, tama yung resti, but if you look at the, hindi ko naman elaborate yung business model, all this uh, supply and value added chain and the, 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 the agro-based industrial cluster model specifies specific uh, R&D areas for research. No? So makita mo doon sa component at the industry level and also at the commodity level, naroon yung mga importanting gaps na dapat madresan. Kaya kung titignan ng university yung sistema ng agro-based industrial cluster model, may kita mo na sa isang jigsaw puzzle, hindi nakakabuo sapagkat maraming butas. Tayo naglalagay na maraming pera, wala na mga resulta, walang aksyon, kasi butas na nga yung ating butas eh. So kinakailangan ma mabuo mo, ma-address ma mo yung mga gaps na yan at naroon, di naman natin matatapos yan ngayon, sabi mo nga, dyan papasok yung UPLP alumni. For example, kinakailangan natin malakas. Paano daw ito ma 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 natin manu-neutralize yung mga walang iyang congressman, mga walang iyang senador? Kinakailangan natin maroon tayong lobbying. The lobbying must be started by UPLB Alumni Association in sync with UPLB as an institution, the whole OP system with uh, Francis Laurel there para yung screen fee budget, yung screen fee, talaga namang napakaliit. Pagkataas inilalagay pa sa kawalan niya, sa corruption, ay eh, lalo nang walang mangyayari sa ating agriculture sector. I have done, for example, the lobbying. For 15 years, yung organic agriculture hindi, sumas hindi nagalaw. So we lobby it strongly. Pero ang lobbying mo will be more effective kung meron tayong data, kung meron tayong information, at meron tayong action agenda to make it happen. Ngayon, dyan tayo magpe-pressure. So I propose uh, Mr. President na tsaka RESTI and uh, the University, mag tayo ay mag-invest sa lobbying and that is where my, our camp no, our camp will come in. To, to camp namin na natin na, 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 yung PKP industry leaders at saka itong people like the industry leaders like yung NASA Agri Logistics, yung Royal Cargo pinakita lang natin para makita natin ang importansya ng value chain. So, I would like to rest there. I I think I'd like to congratulate uh, to thank uh, the people that I have recommended to be with us and I am very happy so far, so good, and we would like to thank UPLB Alumni Association, especially the, the webinar series committee, and of course the the UP Alumni uh, Association uh, Secretariat, yung Alumni Affairs. So, salamat po, salamat, and good day, good day. Okay, from my side, uh, from Royal Cargo point of view, um, to me, uh, the biggest takeaway here is, you know, we can see 
marami tayong parallel um, na gustong ma-achieve. And um, fr- from our point of view, nakikita namin, of course, while well, there are several areas um, of, of, the, um, of the development that needs to happen, we see opportunities as it is um, by just merely looking at you know, a reduction of spoilage in, in transit when we transport the goods. So there, um, we see that um, you know we don't have to wait um, para mag improve ang um, harvest and quality. There are already good enough harvest, but we just need to market them more effectively. And um, in there, um, in our engagement, particularly our CEOs active in the European Chamber of Commerce, uh, we're pushing uh, agri um, uh, cooperation in Europe. Um, we know that there's a big market there. As an example, just uh, one piece of sweet mango costs about eight euro per piece. So there's a lot of market um, demand for our products. We just need to connect uh, the right parties. And as we've said, we need willing and cooperative, uh, willing and capable cooperatives to, uh, to supply, um, supply the raw materials. Particularly, um, we're aiming for uh, sweet mangoes, and um, and coconuts, um, young coconut, uh, in, in specific to that uh, product. Okay. Captain Barajas would like to. Speak. Okay, uh, to to Doctor Gas. Uh, well, one of the objectives that we have in the alumni association is uh, to inform the university kung po pwede ang uh, instead of having a thesis, undergraduate thesis. Eh, baka pwede lang ang job training ano, for a semester. So, I've been in the banana industry for uh, 28 years. No? At uh, kitang-kita ko ang applicability ng isang estudyante na pwedeng uh, mag-undy job training. No? Unang-una, if you're entomology uh, major, pathology major, ag, uh, lahat siya sa patient disease control, pwede mag-training. Hmm. Yung, uh, kung sa agronomy ka naman, pwede ka sa uh, banana production. Kung sa food processing, pwede ka rin sa pier. Kasi alis lahat ng mga uh, uh, banana group ay may kanilang niyang pier because of the refrigerated uh, bands ano, na inoopre. So uh, they can uh, uh, have their practice also. No? So is there a possibility with our connection to those uh, various uh, banana plantations na halimbawa isang estudyante from LB majoring in uh, uh, either entomology or pathology na gusto mag-training sa patient disease control. Ngayon, ang problema natin, especially sa student, going to Mindanao is plain fare. Saka accommodation. Uh, uh, not exactly hotel, no? because they can stay sa bank houses or they can stay with the supervisors. Do you think we can arrange that uh, as of today? Kasi yung mga barkada ko noon na plantation managers, eh, wala, wala na eh. Mga retired na sila eh. No? So, I, I don't know if you still have some uh, younger uh, generation of the uh, plantation managers na pwede natin ipakiusap na yung ating mga LB students na would like to go on the job training for a semester, I can go there for free. Uh, sagot ang transportation, back and forth ng aeroplano, yung station food and uh, bank houses. So what do you think, uh, Dr. Gaz? A very good idea, uh, uh, Manny. And uh, actually, this is already going on. Huli lang tayo sa Los Baños. Well, for a good reason. Actually, USEP uh, and the uh, universities in the South, they're doing that already. And they may have their MS student or undergraduate students work with the, with the, uh, with the uh, companies. I know that because I have advised, uh, uh, not officially, but I advise them technically uh, because I'm not a faculty member of, the, of those. We can do that. Uh, that should be, but we have to select what is our strength. Uh, that, that we want to train them. That's one. But you see, I'm more concerned also on, you know, the, the, the resources that we lack also is the service of alumni who have been in the industry for many years, like me and the others, do who have retired. Why can't, I mentioned to Shele, Dr. Habito, we should tap them to teach, not necessarily tennis, I tennis thesis, but uh, to teach in a course. 
uh, part of the course on what uh, their experiences are. Those are alumni who have earned so much experiences in the industry. If we can top them as a part of the teaching staff, not, uh, not regular, but uh, maybe an invited lecturer, things like that. And that is what we are missing in the university. And I have been complaining on this because I think there is, a, not actually complaining, there is a kind of... Uh, uh, I don't know if it is a uh, protective uh, uh, reason in the university that uh, they, they do it by themselves because we have so many professors that kulang na sila nang ituturo and hindi na sila nakipag-share. But that can be, that can be uh, an area where UPLBAA can uh, liaise with the university how to tap this uh, experience uh, industry people to participate in the, uh, in the uh, instruction function of the university and even the research function of the university. So that, aside from on the job training, we can also participate in teaching. Okay, all right. So, napakainit ng usapan. Uh, but uh, we, uh, tandaan po natin, um, ito ay smaller picture lang po of what's uh, to happen in the UPLB alumni industry uh, summit. So I'm sure that you have more inputs or insights regarding uh, the operational uh, linkages uh, that can, can be used towards the partnership between UPLB alumni and industry. So we'll all uh, expect that to be, uh, to be consolidated dun sa ating summit on November 6, 2021. Now, um, at this point of the program, uh, we would like to award the certificates uh, of appreciation to our panel members. So can we um, project the uh, certificate in the screen? Thank you. So let me just read the citation. University of, Los Ban uh, University of the Philippines, Los Banos, Certificate of Appreciation. This certificate is presented to uh, name of panel, uh, for sharing his valuable knowledge as panelists during the Academe Alumni Industry Linkages, an operational perspective webinar held on 28th of September 2021 from 9.30 a.m. 12 noon via Zoom. Signed, Rex L. Navarro and Eileen Lorena M. Mamino. So we award this certificate to Mr. Pablito M. Villegas. Thank you very much. We also award the certificate to Mr. Crisanto S. Welberto II. Thank you very much. To Dr. Agustin B. Molina Jr. Thank you. And lastly, to Mr. Michael Kirk Royberg. Thank you very much to all our uh, panel members. And for all our participants who are, uh, who are still interested in uh, giving insights to our panel members, as well as our committee. Um, you can uh, contact them directly. We'll be showing the uh, contact information of our panel members uh, through the post-webinar pub materials. So thank you po. Um, now a reminder po para dun sa ating mga participants, uh, please uh, fill out the uh, evaluation and survey form. Okay, the link is shown now on the on the chat box uh, to your right. Um, kindly answer the evaluation form to get your e-certificate. All right. So at this point, uh, we are now... Yes, Paul. change lang yung date ng certificate kasi September 28th ang nakalagay. All right. Thank you. Okay, pa. Okay, pa. All right. Uh, for the technical team. Again, uh, congratulations. But before we end our program, we have to hear a synthesis. And to give us uh, the synthesis for today's webinar, uh, may I call on Assistant Professor Normito R. Zapata of the College of Economics and Management to give us to the synthesis for today's webinar. Good afternoon to everyone and congratulations to all our distinguished panelists for that very uh, excellent presentation. Now, all of our panelists, uh, uh, shared with us the issues uh, that the Philippine agriculture is now facing. But I guess all of them have uh, shared with us their ideas about the central issue. The central issue now is 
how can the academe, alumni, and the industry work together to develop a food and agriculture value chain that is inclusive, smart, and resilient? Inclusive in the sense that even the small farmers can participate and gain some economic returns that are fair. Smart, the value chain that uses technology to become efficient and effective. And resilient, being able to survive, even progress, and improve during times of disasters. Now, the issue faced uh, or presented to us by our panelists is how to operationalize the link between the industry, alumni, and academe in order to support agriculture. While our lead panelist, Mr. Pablito Villegas, presented an integrated approach, the value chain and agro-based industry cluster business model. But how do we operationalize this? Well, our lead panelists share their experiences, recommendations, and also uh, some of their ideas about this. And I classify these ideas into three. Well, the alumni will be serving as a link between the academe and the industry in these three aspects. One is technology transfer, the second one is human resource development, and the third one is infrastructure development. In terms of technology transfer, Dr. Molina mentioned about research for development towards impact, where it is the industry that will tell the university what they need instead of the scientists and the university telling the industry what they're supposed to use or what technology they're supposed to to, to get. So it is driven by what is needed by the industry, thereby allowing the technology to be responsive to the requirements of the market and at the same time the economic incentives required by the industry. Of course, there are various organizational arrangements available for this, including licensing, spin off, and many others. The second group of recommendation is about human resource development. It was mentioned about the need for our students to become interns in the industry so that their learnings in the university can be complemented by actual practices and problems faced in industry. But not only that, it was mentioned uh, earlier about faculty executive exchange, wherein faculty members and researchers themselves can immerse themselves in the industry so as to improve their knowledge about what is happening in the industry. And at the same time, the executives or the managers in the industry teaching at the university, thereby sharing their experiences in what is actually happening in the industry. And finally, the third one is infrastructure development. There are infrastructure that is needed by both the industry and also the academic. This includes the digital technology, for communication and coordination. Uh, Mr. Golberto mentioned about hubs and spokes facility, and also Mr. Pamintuan mentioned about the logistics facility. And of course, we have SNT Park Innovation Laboratories and many infrastructure needed by both the industry and the academe, and the alumni will serve as the bridge between the two. Of course, our participants also raised some valid concerns like institutional arrangement, governance system, uh, middlemen, opportunities in the banana industry, the role of LGUs, and many more. However, our panelists are very clear that there must be an enabling environment for all of these uh, uh, solutions to work. The presence of organized farmers through cooperatives and various arrangements, the presence of market that will absorb the products, of course, integrated logistics that would facilitate the transport of products from the farm to the market, effective coordination among the academe, the industry, and also the alumni, the strong partnership that is based on trust and mutual benefits, and of course, enabling policies and laws. But I guess the central message of this forum is basically that alumni could serve as a catalyst for development in agriculture by forging a strong relationship between the academe and the industry. Again, thank you very much and congratulations to all of our panelists. All right, thank you very much, Sir June, for that synthesis. Now, I would just like again to remind uh, everyone uh, that uh, ito pa ito ay ano pa lang um, operational uh, perspective pa lang ng ating UPLP alumni industry linkages so there are still more to come uh, for next week it will be the industrial perspective so that the takeaways from today's webinar not only from the insights of the panel discussions 
but also from our participants is crucial as we move forward to the remaining webinars that will unfold in this webinar series. So this is why we invite all our participants today uh, to share their experience to fellow UPLB alumni and continue attending in the webinars to come. Okay, And we hope to integrate all these insights during the UPLB Alumni Industry Summit on November 6, 2021. So we would also like to thank uh, the working committee for this webinar series headed by uh, Dr. Myra Borines. And of course, uh, to the UPLB OAR for assisting us in making this uh, webinar possible. All right. So as we conclude today's webinar, may I call on Dr. Cristino M. Colliado, the overall chair of the UPLB Alumni Summit, to give us the closing remarks. By way of closing this uh, second leg of our webinar series, and on behalf of the UPLBAA, uh, represented here by President uh, Manny Baradas, and also the Office of Alumni Affairs, uh, represented here by Dr. Aileen Mamino. Gusto kong ulit din napasasalamat sa lahat ng mga naging speakers natin sa umagang ito. Naging uh, mas maliwanag po ang ating pangunawa sa mga kailangan pa nating gawin, gampanan at planuhin para po maisakatupara ng ating minimithing uh, UPLB Alumni and Industry Triumvirate. I will be uh, leaving a parting request sa lahat po ng mga nagsalita. Maaari po ba na ang bawat isa inyo ay gumawa ng at least three thesis topics na po pwede po nating ipasa sa mga dekano, sa mga researchers, para po yung mga susunod na mga, yung mga seniors ngayon ay magkaroon po ng idea na ito pala ang napapanong mga tema ng research na dapat ating pagtuunan. We will appreciate po kung ito ay magiging uh, seed ideas para po sa binabalak nating uh, convening a, a research on uh, no committee on research review para po ang ating research agenda sa university ay maging align napapanahon at tumutungo sa mga ilangan ng industry. And with that, once again, thank you po sa lahat ng mga nagbigay ng panahon at nag-share na kanilang mga ideas at talino para po maging matagumpay ang ating second webinar series. Right. Right. Salamat po. Well, uh, mga kasama, bago tayo po maghihulay ngayon, uh, sumobro na tayo ng 38 minutes, no? <laughs> Uh, I'd like to invite the group, bro, lahat ng participant today, na kung tayo po ay katulad namin na Doc Resi at saka nila uh, uh, Almario at si Jair Tabrao na malalakas ang loob. No? Dula po lamang ibig sabihin, eh, malakas ang loob, hindi ba alam mag-zoom. So, iniimbitan po namin kayo uh, coming, this coming uh, Sunday, yung ating pong celebration ng uh, uh, Loyalty Day. So, doon po gagawin sa AXI. Uh, Hindi, sir, sa SEM Conference Room. Saan siya? SEM. SEM, SEM. SEM Conference Room. SEM. Katabi po nung room ng ganon. Okay, ako yung SEM Conference Room. No? Opo. So, uh, meron po tayo doon tanghalian. Tapos uh, virtual, uh, hybrid. Yung iba na malakas ang loob, uh, you can join us. At yung maglalagi tayo ng malaking isip. Screen para globally everybody, all alumni all over the world can participate. So we will start sigur po mga nine o'clock. Nakarakod nila. Ayun nine o'clock. Yes sir, ang ang start po ng program nine o'clock. Ah nine o'clock. Nine o'clock na dun na pa register. So we provide natin po yung Zoom link para everybody can join. At kung malakas po niyo loob ay mag face to face tayo. So bye po salamat. Hmm. All right. Uh, Pag-i-send yung program. Apo. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, reminder lang po para sa ating mga participants answering the evaluation form. Uh, the evaluation form is uh, only available until 12 midnight of today. So kindly please uh, be reminded po. All right. And with that, uh, congratulations and uh, thank you very much.